What's up, viewers and listeners? My name is Jay. I'm a registered nutritionist based here in Bristol, working with BJJ enthusiasts across the globe. On today's episode, we had Daniel the Raspberry Ape Strauss, a black belt under Roger Gracie and Nick Brooks. He is an ADCC, Polaris and Quintet veteran, as well as a commentator for Polaris and Cage Warriors. Dan is a man of many talents, from his dangerous guillotines to bending horseshoes in what can only be described as his cave of grip wonder. In this episode, we talked about... Dan being a skinny teenager to now being 90 kilograms, hating the gay. No, seriously, he really hates the gay. Becoming a meal prep wanker. And of course, we all wanted to know where he gets his incredible shirts from. Unfortunately, no discount code for those uh, who are interested. And we talked about much, much more. We did, however, get a very juicy bonus from this podcast. The truth behind the nickname Raspberry Ape. Is this a true story behind the man? Let us know in the comments below. Thank you for tuning in. Of course, if you're not subscribed, please click that button and turn on notifications for future posts. Thank you for watching and listening. Let's get into episode eight. Oos. Hey guys and girls, my name is Jay. I'm the host of the BJJ Nutrition Podcast. Uh, I run the BDL Nutrition Consultancy and we help jiu-jitsu athletes perform to their best while not doing anything silly with their weight cuts. We are on episode four and I am here with the great Dan Strauss. Thank you, my friend. Thanks, obviously, for being here, mate. We really do appreciate it. Um, for anyone new, obviously, to the channel or may not be aware of the jiu-jitsu scene as much as we are, do you want to give a bit of an introduction and background to yourself to begin with? And uh, my name is Daniel Strauss. Uh, <laughs> others may know me as the Raspberry Ape. I have been trained Jiu Jitsu for 17 years now, something uh, that makes me feel very old. Um, <laughs> and I'm a black belt under Roger Gracie. In a month or two time, I'll be a third degree. So I would have been a black belt Ooh. for nine years. Wow. Which also makes me feel old. Uh, I've com been lucky and fortunate enough to compete all over the world in uh, some great Tournaments and great shows. I've competed on Polaris, uh, Quintet, um, EBI, ADCC, um, and pretty much everything in between. And yeah, that's it. I've been teaching Jiu Jitsu for 16 years. Um, and I do a bit of commentary yes. for Polaris, Enyo, and for Cage Warriors these days. And that's about it. Nice. Uh, well, again, obviously, <laughs> saying that 17 years, there's going to be some jiu-jitsu athletes who are at 17 at the moment having aspirations from there, not to rub it in there a bit more type thing. But No, I've trained with some people who have not who have been alive <laughs> less time than I've been, doing, I've been teaching jiu-jitsu. It's quite sad, yeah. Uh, but obviously, when we have a quick stalk through the Instagram page, obviously, you didn't touch on it, but we are in the... the, the we're, we're in the, the cave. We're in the cave we're in the of cave. every single toy, which I keep on looking around, <laughs> and I'm like, there's something else I haven't even picked up on just yet, type thing. Like, what on earth is this type we'll of... We'll play like, off. Again, that's that one there. What on earth is which that? Which one? What on earth is this? Oh, that? Okay, give me, uh, grab me uh, like one of the light um, grippers and I'll show you. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no, not that weird one. Well, the one uh, next to it, one next to it. Yeah, next yeah, yeah, yeah. To it. Right. So this is called a moles to millimeters. And it's a, it's a progression aid for uh, torsion spring grippers like this, like Captain's a Crush. Yep. Uh, so imagine you're, you're trying to do a gripper and you can't get it closed. Well, this has uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like eight, nine different variation so you'll try and get it close to this oh and okay when you get stronger you get smaller and eventually smaller so it's from moles to millimeters wow okay and that this. is very cool <laughs> yeah. i was yeah. like oh all right, i'll put it back i know otherwise it'll get lost and it'll be like oh you lost this and i'll be like no sorry yeah, it my <laughs> <laughs> took it home i'll be like i'm not coming back it's, uh, have you ever seen um a guy who's like uh one of these autistic savants who knows the word, who knows the number pi to like a thousand or ten thousand. And if you 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 write pi with a thousand, uh, you know, decimal places on a board, but you make 
make a few mistakes, yeah. he'll look at it and he'll start to like, <laughs> vomit because it's something's out of place. Yeah. That's what I am like with this with this wall. Might do something's it. out of place. I played this game actually where I, I close my what? eyes and uh, people would take things down or move things. And I can tell pretty far. Wow, we'll have to yeah. try and test that later. We might move a few things around and like open the door and be like, right down here, you get like a Labrador trying to find a dog. Like, like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's gone wrong? And try and find it from there. Like, like Jazzy and Mr. Burke. Yeah, oh, Donald, <laughs> Donald Trump. <laughs> Trump. <laughs> um, well, yeah, obviously, again, you've got the jiu-jitsu background, obviously, from there. And obviously, a lot of the strongman and grip stuff, obviously, mm. into it. Um, were both of them at the same sort of time in terms of like your interest with it? or No, it's like... Uh, when I started jiu-jitsu, I was 15 years old, and I was a very, I was a very, always a very skinny kid. I'm like, I'm really not gifted athletically in any way, shape, or form. Like, I've trained really hard for a really long time. Yeah. Um, and uh, but I have no real um, natural genetic gifts physically at all. Um, so when I started training jiu-jitsu, I was 15, and I was like 50 kilos. <laughs> Very, very skinny, like very weak. I was never good at any sports when I was, you know, below that age. Um, so naturally, I got into jiu-jitsu and I really loved it. Um, but you get that frustrated thing where I'm getting beaten up by these bigger people. <laughs> now, at the time, when, I'm, when you're like 50, 55 kilos, the giants that were beating me up were 70 kilos. <laughs> and I literally remember, I'm like, one day I'm going to be... I'm going to be 70 kilos <laughs> and then I will beat them. And uh, which obviously is hilarious because 70 is like really quite small uh, for like a grown man. Uh, but yeah, so I got into strength training, I'd say a couple of years after I started training jiu-jitsu. Okay. Um, when, when I was like 16, 17, I started off by reading uh, Dinosaur Training by Brooks Kubik. Okay. And that, that got me that like, that's the Bible to me. That got me into strength training. I've basically been strength training ever since. Nice. Yeah. Cool. And I must ask then, obviously, with how popular the sport is now, mm. obviously, the average kid will see, I don't know, Tony Temper doing it on his story, doing jiu-jitsu yeah. and stuff like that, and a few other celebrities type of thing, which is really, really cool. Obviously, back from the point where you started it, yeah. again, probably, I'd probably say Karate Kid was probably more popular at the time in terms of like what mixed martial arts are going on from there. Make Guy, He's a year older than me. I know, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm being realistic in the sense that jiu-jitsu probably wasn't as well known no, at the time. No, not at all, so, not at all. What was the encouragement for it? Was it parents, family, friends, something like that that came along and obviously kind of got you inspired? Into I it? never, ever um, joined a, jiu a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu club. Really? No. I started, I was interested in martial arts um, and I, against my parents' wishes, <laughs> um, I, was, I was interested in martial arts and I tr tried to train a load of different ones. Yep. Uh, but none that I really stuck with. And then I started training Japanese Jiu-Jitsu okay. at Mill Hill Jiu-Jitsu Club, which was a Japanese, an Ishimaru Japanese Jiu-Jitsu jiu -jitsu Club. Um, but my uh, instructor, or who would later go on to be my Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu instructor, was one of the coaches there. But at that point, he had found Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and he'd seen the light, <laughs> the epiphany. So he was there, but he wasn't really taking too much part of the Japanese jiu-jitsu side. He kind of just used the mat space to roll around. Yep. Um, so, so yeah, long story short, I, n I never joined a jiu Brazilian jiu-jitsu club. I joined a Japanese jiu-jitsu club, which eventually, through circumstances, became a Brazilian jiu-jitsu club. Yeah. And that was the same gym that I was with when I got my black belt. I'm intrigued. What other martial arts did you try then? Have you got oh, any belts elsewhere? Uh, I have a yellow sash in Wing Chun. Uh, I did JKD for a little, I mean, I was, we're talking between the ages of maybe like 13 and maybe 12, 13, 14. Yeah. Um, you know, I did a couple of lessons of judo, a couple of lessons of, uh, you know, fucking other bollocks, taekwondo and karate and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, those bollocks, right? I've got a few Muay Thai friends who obviously have this like, uh, it's a bit of an ongoing joke, like what would you do if your kid starts taking up taekwondo? They just just disown them. Like, yeah. it's just straight away. Like, not having that type I'm of thing. Like the guy on Instagram at the moment who Oh, Teep tight, yeah. He is, he's hilarious. hilarious. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it's great with that. Um, we've obviously always had different sports then, obviously. Is there what stuck for you with the Japanese Jiu Jitsu then? Was there something specific? or No, the Japanese Jiu Jitsu, I, I was there for a while, um, and but it, never, it, it didn't really grab me. And then the main instructor left uh, and my who would later be my jiu-jitsu instructor Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor Nick took a class and, and showed us some grappling stuff and I was like oh what is this yeah um so eventually when everything became basically we 
once one of the instructors left, it became like hybrid. We do a bit of stick stuff, a bit of knife, a bit of Japanese Jiu Jitsu, and a bit of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And then eventually it went pure Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, but when we started doing the grappling stuff, I was like, this is awesome. This nice. is what I want to do. Nice. Yeah. How long did it take for the parents to accept you doing this type of stuff? Was Ooh, it a few years? Or? Ten years. Ten years. <laughs> Probably. Ten years. Probably ten years. I right. got my black belt or something. Yeah. That must have been an interesting point. Obviously, with you competing, obviously, all across the globe and yeah. stuff like that, was there a penny drop moment for them, do you think, when they kind of said, oh, it's actually quite serious in what he's doing and how well he's going type thing. Uh, yeah, probably after about 10 years. Yeah, so 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that then. Um, so obviously transitioning into the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu style of things, which is pretty mm. cool. I presume obviously it was, again at that time, probably the Dominic Gi um, that you were doing or was it a good mixture at the start as well? No Gi and Gi or? Yeah, uh, so I have always like had a natural affinity to no Gi stuff. Yep. Um, even when, so up until I'd say brown belt i would train a 90 percent gi and i'd only train no gi if i had a no gi tournament coming up and maybe i'd do six to eight weeks no gi yeah um but i don't even think that we had a i don't even think we had a regular weekly no gi or maybe we had one a week which was my class uh so i started teaching when i was 16. wow yeah i started teaching um but I'm, I'm, it was gi to begin with, but then eventually no gi because I was interested in it. And my instructor just didn't care for it at all. He didn't consider it real jiu jitsu. Didn't, <laughs> didn't, didn't want gi at all. Uh, no gi at all. So he, uh, I would teach a no gi class uh, uh, once a week, uh, and went, starting from when I was sixteen, and basically onwards. Um, but yeah, I trained med- uh, predominantly in the gi. But then I just and I think there was a point where where I was seen more as a no gi person. I did prefer it. I always preferred it. Or at the very least, I preferred it when I wasn't doing it. You know, it was yeah. like a, you get a sweet and salty popcorn. Yeah. The salty tastes better after you've eaten the sweet, and then the sweet tastes better after a bit of salt. So I trained gi, and then I want to do no gi, and then I trained no gi, and I want to do the gi. And it would go back and forth, and it got to a point where oh, I don't want to do gi. <laughs> I still don't want to do gi. I'm still trying not. I still don't want to do gi. Um, and, and really for me, it was, I, I think when the modern gi game, I say now, I mean, it's still being utilized to some degree, but this is sort of 10 years ago. Mm. Uh, but when the, the modern at the time gi game was coming in, which was like a lot of lapel guard stuff, it was like very, what I consider to be quite separate from the aesthetics of what jiu-jitsu was at its, inception mm. um and and just was a little bit it just didn't sit right with me like mm-hmm. grabbing onto the pell and then like what we later call like worm guard and stuff like that yeah. i just didn't really like it so uh i had a lot more success in nogi competition which then meant i was being invited for more nogi competitions which means that my time was being distributed more to nogi yeah and then after i got my black belt um maybe a year or two after that i just stopped training gi. wow okay just stopped and i and i have i basically have i in the since I got my black belt almost nine years ago, I'd say I've rolled in the gi 15 times or less. Wow. But that's in the last nine years. In the last six years, I'd say I've rolled in the gi three or four times. <laughs> so it must be a big day. Is it like on birthdays and something like this? Like, oh, we'll put this on. Uh, <laughs> so I put the gi on a lot more. I put the gi on for like, if I go to affiliates, I need to do gradings and stuff like that, but I just yeah. don't roll. You just don't roll. Just don't roll. <laughs> the last time I rolled in the gi, I haven't rolled in the gi properly in probably three years. And the, I, I did, with, within those three years, I rolled once uh, because I turned up to a class that was no, that I thought was no gi, so everyone was training <laughs> gi. But I wanted to roll, so I put my gi on and I rolled for like three minutes, I took it off and went home. <laughs> didn't want to do it anymore. Love that. Hate it. Something you touched on there, you had a lot of success in the no gi. Yeah. If, for example, you had more success in the gi, do you think that transition wouldn't have been as immediate, do you think? or <sighs> Who knows? Who knows? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It, like, it happened as it happened. Like, when I look at it now, I don't know what it is. Like, if people hear me talk about the gi, it sounds like I hate the gi, mm. which is completely true. <laughs> oh, that's gonna be a perfect clip. That's the guy who gets Cody Jones. Say, you think you're good at jujitsu? You're probably not. <laughs> uh, I just hate it. I just hate it. Just don't like it. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 but for that. me, for me, just like uh, 
I love grappling in its purest form and I just feel like the naked body is the purest form of grappling and we can't go naked because it would be considered obscene. Uh, is that the reason for the real short shorts? That's why, even <laughs> so what I wear when I train is basically a modest uh, simulation of uh, nudity. Yeah. <laughs> That's completely serious. You know the word gym comes from the word naked? No. You know that? Yeah. No. It comes from, gymnasium comes from gymnos, which is Greek for naked. Wow. Okay. Because in, back in the day in ancient Greece, you would, it was actually, um, you were banned from wearing clothes. So we're kind of going backwards with all these pump shirts and stuff like that at the moment, where people want all the baggy trousers, but bubby t shirt I mean, I don't like training, uh, I, I like rash guards, I don't like bare chest, just because you get too sweaty. Yeah. Uh, but if sweat wasn't an issue, Valley two day shorts, and that's all you need. Perfect, love it. Take it back. Um, so you mentioned obviously your weight progress from good old 50 kilograms yeah. upwards. Um, and obviously you combine that with some strongman training and stuff like that, which is cool. Was there quite, uh, again, obviously it's all going to come from diet to begin with and trying yeah. to put on weight and stuff like that. Without the strength training, do you think you would have progressed as quickly, do you feel? or Weight-wise or through jiu-jitsu-wise or like size-wise or... Let's go size-wise and just actual like body composition changes. Do you think... If I didn't lift, would I be as muscular as I am? No. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. And there no. we go. Podcast wrap. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, yeah, so, so I... Uh, the, the, the thing is with my weight gain, it's very extreme when you hear like 55 kilos to 90 kilos. Mm. Uh, but you also have to bear in mind that I was... I would have... Um, gained weight if I wasn't training, wasn't eating much, just because I was still growing. growing. Yeah. So I was like 15 years old at that time, um, and you know we grow to like kind of our early 20s. Mm. Um, but the strength training was a big part of it for me. Um, I would say, I would say my natural weight without uh, attempting the put on weight or without lifting would be in the mid 70s. Okay. Is about for my frame. Um, so when I was, I competed in ADCC, I was 20 years old, uh, 2011, uh, and I competed under 77 kilos. Okay. So that was sort of my natural weight, like quite lean, quite skinny. I was like doing some physical training, but um, my physical training was not like lots of heavy lifting or anything like that. It was very much conditioning based for jujitsu. Um, and then it was, <clears throat> when I competed in ADCC and I was like, these guys are fucking humongous, like all of them. <laughs> like the Mendez brothers walk past me and they're under 66 kilos and they're like, they look like they're ready to step onto a bodybuilding show. <laughs> just like ridiculous. Uh, so at that point I'm like, okay, well, I think I need to purposely try and get bigger mm -hmm. to, if, you, if you're like in a room with a hundred people and they all look the same and you look different, then, and you wanna be doing what they're doing, you go, well, I'm gonna try and look more like them. So I started eating um, and trying to put on weight. But I wasn't on any steroids, so uh, I got fat and really ill, uh, trying to like force 10 kilos on myself in a matter of months. I actually, <clears throat> so I went from 75 kilos to 85 kilos, like stuff in my face. I mean, if you want to talk about some of the stupid ways that I was putting weight on, I, I mean, they, they work, but like not well. Um, <laughs> and uh, I remember I got to 85 kilos, <clears throat> and that was like a, like a benchmark of mine, like a goal that I wanted to get to. Yeah. And I got to that weight, and... Um, and then I just had some horrendous stomach bug and just like vomited and diarrheaed out five kilos back down to like <laughs> 79. I'm like, what is the point of this? Um, so yeah. Uh, I was gonna say, let's touch on that obviously in terms of food preparation, obviously um, the stigma behind it is just eat more and obviously lift heavy, which to some degree you've got as a generalized statement, but it's obviously a bit more, but you can be a bit more strategic with the approach type of thing. Why such a short time frame? Obviously, you competed at ADCC, yeah. and then when we were like, oh, I need to put on weight type of thing, was there yeah, another I was major? Yeah, twenty years old. Yeah, like, everyone wants something as fast as possible. True, right? true. Everyone wants it. You say like, you, what do you want to do? I want to bench uh, fifty kilos more. Okay, would well, you want to do it in five years, or do you want to do it in ten days? You go, fuck it, I'm gonna go in ten, ten days. days. Yeah, right. Like that's 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 like a natural because the faster you hit your goal, the faster you can move on to the next stage of the plan. Sure. So uh, if, 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 if in my mind what I needed to do was to put on weight, I wanted to do it as fast as possible. And uh, despite that hiccup, I continued, um, not as aggressively, but I continued to put on weight over the next uh, year or two. And, and to the point that I was at 90 kilos, which was my goal. Um, I mean, I was holding a lot of water. I, w I was not like at the weight properly. So as soon as you stop force feeding yourself, and I'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, like 
what I was doing yeah. to, 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 to get weight on. Uh, but at the same time, I think a really important thing to bear in mind for this is the age. Yeah. When you're 19, 20, 21, 22. Hormones are through the roof. Like your hormones are through the roof, but like your, you can just do whatever you want basically and you'll be all right. Yeah. You yeah. really can. Yeah. Like you can eat cheese, but like I was on a seafood diet. <laughs> seafood, you eat it. I mean, I literally, I literally had, uh, like if someone offered me something, I had to, like that was a, like a rule that I had. If someone offers me food, I have to say yes. Doesn't matter what it is. You're like, like you want, you want a, you want a scoop of ice cream? Yeah. Do you want a, do you want a piece of birthday cake? Yep. Just everything, and you just like eat as much as you can around the training. And like, even when I was putting on not good weight, it still wasn't bad to be honest with you. Yeah. It's like compared to now, ten years later, where I'm trying to put weight on now, but I have a very long term approach. Yeah. And I eat clean as fuck. Like, yeah. like, I do the opposite. If someone offers me something, I don't eat it. Yeah. Like, I don't eat out. I don't get takeaways. Like, not, like but I basically eat the exact same thing every single day with almost no variation. Okay. It's just a very different way. But that's that's purely to do with age. So, young Dan was basically in Costco, basically getting all the free samples from everyone going like, yeah, I, I mean, want a bit of cheese. I was <laughs> that's basically how I, that's basically the true reason of how I got the raspberry nickname. Because the Costco had the best raspberries, right? And I used to go with my with my training partner, strength conditioning coach. We used to go to Costco and get shitloads of food, and we used to get pallets of raspberries, and I'd be eating these raspberries all day long. And that's eventually when I came to picking a nickname. That was one of the deciding factors. <laughs> In like a hundred podcasts that people have interviewed me, and that's the first time they've ever actually heard the real. Hey, story there we go. I've, I've heard many iterations uh-huh, of the, uh-huh. the nickname. The, my favorite one is the uh, you did with. Um, I think it was BJJ East magazine. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Made up the story about the World War II yep. underground. <laughs> yeah. Made yep. it so immaculately told story. Oh, the like, EBI countdown was like, and his granddad was in the Vietnam War. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true, that's true. I love it. That's true. Either that yeah. or he just had a fed us another story. And yeah. we're like, right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> the story continues. I mean, if that was that. a story that I said to you, that is a boring one. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The made up ones are much more interesting. Oh, it's uh, but yeah, so... so um, so yeah, the, the diet's very different now. Uh, but basically, my the way that I did it was I literally forced the weight on. So mm. I'd have a I'd have a goal of what I wanted to weigh each week. Yeah. And I'd have to I couldn't sleep. I would not allow myself to go to sleep until I could stand on the scales out that way. Oh wow. Okay. So see. let's say uh, I'm and this is not. This works if you want to increase your body weight, but it's not what I would advise someone to do in order to do that, but it does work, which is let's say, uh, let's say I'm 90 kilos right now, my goal is to get to 100 kilos. So for all of next week, it's gonna be, not, I, I do like half a kilo a week. Yeah. So let's say um, this week I'm gonna be 91. If I step on the scales in the evening before I go to bed, let's say 10 o'clock at night, I step on the scales and I'm 91.2, sound. Head down, get to sleep. Uh, maybe I haven't eaten much today. I step on the scales and I'm 89. I go, oh, okay. I go downstairs and I eat. And I keep eating until I'm 91 kilos. Now, sometimes that would be, uh, it could be a glass of water. Like, yeah. It's not even like, it's yeah. just a completely arbitrary number that I have to hit any means possible. Even if it's like, I mean, this glass of water isn't going to help me put on weight, yeah. is it? But it's just this it's idea that if I keep yeah. on, uh, but I remember there was times that the, the like one the ones that really stick into mind that like this is gonna sound fucking stupid. Three o'clock in the morning, I'm eating a half a kilo of pasta. Because 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 I had the way eighty seven point five, and I've come in from training. I'm eighty four. <laughs> Right, I've had like two hard days. I haven't eaten enough, and I'm 84 kilos. Okay, so I'd have like an I'd, it would be like a protein shake that was this amount of key. I'd have a half liter of um, butternut squash yeah. and sweet potato soup because like soup, like you could drink it. Yeah. And then if you got real extreme, it's like but pasta, yeah. just bowls of pasta until I got the weight on, and I go to bed and I feel fucking it's sick. sick. Yeah, but I, weighed, but I weighed the weight that I needed the weight. It's interesting. So, it's kind of like the flip, like the Uno Reverso in terms of like. Um, I don't it's probably extreme. Weight Watchers women have been completely mm. obsessed with like, well, why is my weight? I'm going to starve myself until I hit that number for the next day yeah. type thing, but exactly, on the yeah. complete opposite scale. Exactly. Of being, so let's yeah. put on the weight. Um, obviously, it was quite uh, generalized in terms of that approach from the calories, that type of thing. Any consideration for that? Or was it just literally food volume at that point? I've never um, really, I've never counted calories okay. ever. It's like the one thing that I haven't really done. Um, I don't know. I guess... Even when I was putting on weight, I had like a rough 
uh, schedule of what I was eating. Yeah. But uh, but it wasn't super precise. I could count calories now and know exactly what I was eating because I basically eat the same the exact same sure. thing every day. Um, but it's just never been something for whatever reason I felt. Oh, you know, it's just a little bit too extreme. But then I do. I like. I weigh my food now. You know where this, every every piece of items are. Well, I, wait, I, I, know, <laughs> I know exactly like how many grams all my meals are today. Like, okay. But, but if you told me that that's what I'd be doing three years ago, I'd say that you were fucking mad. But yeah. but but that's what I. It's is game changing. The, yeah. Like meal prep, I've never ever wanted to be a meal prep loser. Tupperware containers, weighing your food. It just seems like the lamest shit I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. That's exactly what I do. That's exactly what I do now. I weigh all my food out. It doesn't take that long. It takes me an hour and a half to cook um, 10 meals. Yeah. Five days. Uh, it's, 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 it's half my food for five days. Um, and, uh, but, the, but the convenience, when you invest in your preparation, one... I mean, sim- the simple stuff is like, if you want to eat well, you can't be thinking, what am I having for my next meal? Mm. You can't be. Because like, a bi- and, and then the other problem is, is you're going off of your feeling in the moment. Yeah. So it hits this time, it hits lunchtime, or you start <laughs> to feel hungry. You wait until you start to feel hungry, yeah. and you go, what do I want? You go, I'm fucking starving. Yeah. Oh, uh, what, what should I eat? Oh, maybe I should have some chicken and rice. Okay, what's that? Oh, I'm fucking... It's gonna take twenty minutes to cook. Like I'm oh, hungry. Like I'm gonna grab some crisps. Yeah. I'm gonna have some chocolate. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this, and that's what everyone does. And yeah. even though like my snacks wouldn't be bad, maybe I have a bit of dark chocolate. Maybe I have a bit of rice cake. You know, like it's not bad stuff. Yeah. But like I know that my next meal will be as soon as I feel hungry at all, I take this out, I put it in the microwave, I have a meal. I'm satiated now for a couple of hours. Yeah. And in a couple of hours' time, when it's time to eat next, I'm never hungry. Yeah, so, it's, it's, so one of the things the approach we try and get clients to do, and obviously this is the word try, because obviously it depends on the individual themselves in terms of how they respond to it, is one, if we were to do, if we weren't to feed you for the next two weeks, mm. right, you'd feel pretty shit, you'd still be standing, your mm. body's going to last that long. What we would actually be able to generate based on your lifestyle and stresses is little hot spots as to where you are most hungry across mm. the day. And again, touching briefly on like times and stuff like that, majority of the population go, oh, look, it's 12 o'clock now, it's lunchtime. They yeah. don't go, am I hungry right yeah. now? And so there's a dis, uh, I don't know what would be the word, disconnection in terms of, sort of actually listening to hunger sensations in the first place yeah. and then also getting the right time where you're not absolutely starving. So you want to try and find those times appropriately. Mm. But then having that food in the right place then obviously takes the variability out of it. Mm. Left to our own demises, we all make shit choices most of the time. And yeah. It, it, then you have that extended time where I've got to cook something. It's the same thing with meal prep or trying to do a recipe or whatever. Some people are like, oh, I want to change things up a little bit. I'm going to try a recipe. And I said, this is great when you've got time spare. Mm. You're trying to do this after picking up the kids, gone to training, mm. and then it's then at Monday evening at nine o'clock. You go through that recipe list and go, I haven't got that, that, that. Oh, I can't be bothered. I'm just yeah. going to grab a pizza quickly. Yeah. And so it's interesting with that structure you've got in there. So I think the real big question is obviously if you're anti meal prep person, why now are you doing it? Because, uh, oh, I'm not anti-meal prep anymore. I'm 100% <laughs> pro-meal prep. I think that everyone should try it. Um, do you know what it was? Is um, One of my big issues in the past was a fear of the microwave. Really? Yes. That was, a, that was um, not an irrational fear. I won't, I won't, <laughs> if you show me a microwave, I won't cry. Uh, but I didn't, want to put, I didn't want to put stuff in the microwave because I had this idea that it was radiation. It was bad luck. Um, until I think it was like Stan. So a big influence of me in terms of nutrition is Stan Effendin and vertical and like digestive health and stuff like that. Yeah. And they were just like, he just had preps his meals and puts them in the microwave. I'm like, well, if it's good enough for him, it's good <laughs> enough for me. And then like when you actually start to learn that microwaving might be one of the the ways that you protect the protein and nutrients in your meal the most yep. because you're not actually bringing it to a super high temperature you're just you know the, the the mechanism of heat is is actually more protective of the nutrients in your food than you know frying it for yeah. example um then you start to not get so scared of it so uh yeah and then and then i want to i'm I, so basically when i do i go away I do these seminar tours that the, uh, the last one i came back from a couple of weeks ago i was away for two months uh and i i lose weight yeah it's impossible for me not to i lose weight so basically 
basically I spend the time that I'm not touring to try and put the weight on <laughs> to, 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 to go into my essential hibernation of being away of being away and then coming back and trying to put it back on. So I came back and I wanted to put some weight back on um, and I wanted to like get hard back in the training and I wanted to like get my nutrition on point. And I genuinely believe, I truly believe this now after doing this for um, for, for some months now, uh, just, this, just maybe if you ignore the time that I was away, I probably meal prepped and eaten like this for probably two months co co combined. Yeah. Um, that that there is it is not possible for you to get your nutrition on point without preparing your meals in advance. I genuinely believe that. I I, I think it's so inconvenient. Like if you're if you're eating the volume that you have to eat, that I have to eat, when you're eating the amount that I have to eat, when you're talking about four, five, six meals a day. Mm. Um, the amount of time that you're going to spend preparing food, if you're preparing every single meal before you eat it, is completely illogical. It takes me an hour and a half, hour and a half just before you guys came, <clears throat> and I got 10 meals. Okay. How long would it take for me to keep, cook each one of those meals individually? Yeah, it's going to be 20 minutes a pop. 20 minutes a pop. Yeah, so you're looking Right? At, you're looking yeah. at a ridiculous amount of time when you put all of those things together. So... Um, so it's much, much easier for me to do it like that. And I just feel that my nutrition has been, is more on point now than it's ever been before. Probably more consistent across the board. Super consistent. And I can control it. If I feel like my weight's getting a little bit too, like if I feel like I need more food, I can add a little bit more in. So like, I, okay, so um, the last, this month, I upped the number, the amount of food that I was eating. So I took my, instead of having three meals a day breakfast and then uh, lunch and dinner, to lunch and dinner, increase the size, split it into two. Yeah. So now I've up my food, but it's way easier for me to eat it. Digestion. So I'm never feeling yeah. stuffed, and then I'm ready to go. And you know, so I'm eating five meals a day. You take twenty minutes to cook each one of those meals. You like? Yeah. Yeah. It's well, a complete waste time. of time. No, I get that. I get that. That's interesting. I think I'd probably slightly disagree in the sense that it can be done without the meal prep. I think the only way that it's going to be feasible is someone who's well rehearsed in understanding what I call the language of food, mm. right? And being in that environment for such a consistent time. It's something which, again, it's when we're in controlled environments, it's very easy to have that yeah. all in line. Yeah. And it's something that I'd say, look, this is basically a meal plan is what you're following, yeah. right? Which, fine, within that control, like, great. But if, for example, you have to go away and do some work, I don't know, with cage warriors or something yeah. like this, for example, you may not, let's say you didn't have that time to prepare. Yeah. Rather than it be all or nothing, I'd rather encourage someone to then kind of say, right, okay, let's look at the foods that we've got around ourselves and oh, understand I mean, them. But like, that, that, that's not a hypothetical. That is like, I go away for eight months, for two yeah. months at a time. Like I don't have any food at my disposal. I have to completely just adapt and adjust to that. But it's never going to be as on, on point as we know. No, it won't be to have the exact gram of everything. There's a yeah. few individuals I'm aware of who are very good at it, but they're very rehearsed at doing it. Yeah. Obviously from their time where they'll pick apart the meals that they'll necessarily pre-prepare type of thing and go, okay, well, actually well, I can make this up myself. That mm. You see many guys obviously will do it girls that matter they'll go to they sound sad with this but chicken fillers for example in yeah. terms of like sandwich and stuff like that they'll go oh cool i'm gonna have a salad i need the protein in the back of this packet i'll whack that in and they'll just start making it on the go on the fly type thing but they haven't done this from i don't know one week into looking to the nutrition they've yeah. been doing this for countless years and sort of time yeah, yeah, yeah. do that from there um so obviously with the weight at the moment you're using that intentionally to put or well bring it back up again do you find the efficiency of it a lot more easier doing it that way compared to, as you mentioned prior, just eat as much as possible type thing? Or? I just can't do that. No? No, I can't do that. I mean, I think uh, my attitude towards food has changed massively over the last couple of years, especially. Um, just from uh, honestly kind of understanding what I fear or what I am repelled from is processing of food okay and uh, the and what goes into the processing of food and it kind of all started to be honest with you with uh michael pollan the okay. food food writer and uh some of his work and some of his books really good book called cooked by michael pollan which i advise everyone reads um but is essentially saying that these things that everyone thinks is bad or this is bad this is bad the only thing really that's bad is like the processing of food mm -hmm. uh and that the biggest the biggest indicator of whether some whether a, a person's going to be healthy or not healthy is not like their gender or race or upbringing or socioeconomic position, but is like how often are they eating out or having takeaways or having pre-prepared meals, you know, microwave meals, uh, versus how much they're cooking from scratch. It's okay. like the biggest indicator of health, like as an outcome, full stop. That's it's really interesting. interesting. Very yeah. interesting. 
so after that I started to kind of just um, I would I used to eat out um, maybe six, seven, eight times a week. Okay. Because I'd go to the gym in the morning, I'd stay out of the house and I'd eat lunch, dinner, like I'd eat out a lot. It couldn't even be more than that, to be honest. And not only is it very expensive, but even if you're thinking, oh, I'm having mashed potato and I'm having um, chicken. Yeah. What's that cooked in? You don't know what that's cooked in. You don't know what, mm. like, you know, rapeseed oil or sunflower oil they're chucking into that. How much sugar are they putting in that? Like, Stuff that is completely out of your control. So, um, so now the idea of me eating burgers and ice cream and processed food really at all is like quite repulsive to me. Okay, that's interesting. Mm. So, was there a flipping point to the point where you've gone from saying I can't do that anymore, like eating everything, obviously, to now having this mm. meal prep? Was there a moment, other than reading the book that you mentioned? Obviously, it's a, at- it's a slow process. Like I had some, uh, I had some moments with my strength and conditioning coach at Andy Marshall where, because I would just eat, I used to just eat shit and then he kind of said like, you're eating, but basically, uh, the majority of adults out there eat like toddlers. Okay. They just like, they do and I've, and I've, I've tried to help some of my, some of the people that I know with their diets who they've been struggling or their performance isn't on point or they're overweight and I asked them to send me what they eat in a day and I'm like, this is fucking disgusting. <laughs> like, I, I can't that. actually believe that you're, that you're, you're like in your 30s and yeah. you're eating like a toddler would eat. Mm. You know, like it's fucking fruit roll-ups and sausage rolls. Like, what are you doing? You know, if you want to eat, if you want to perform like an athlete, you have to eat like an, an athlete. athlete. Yeah. And, uh, and once you really internalize and understand that, um, yeah, it, 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 everything becomes incredibly clear. That's interesting. It's, a, it's something I've mentioned before. As we kind of go through childhood, we have rules and regulations put into place to try and help us just act and feel better mm. in that sense. Like bedtimes, try not mm. to drink too much alcohol, none at all as we get older, that type of thing. Yeah. We're going to give you three meals a day. We're going to yeah. give you certain snacks and that type of stuff, right? And as soon as we hit that sort of 16, 17, 18 marker, we just get... We get the independence. Independence. Yeah. And all of a sudden, all those rules and regulations go, oh, I'm not going to go to bed at 9 o'clock or mm. 10 o'clock or whatever it is. I'm going to stay up until 2 in the morning. Yeah. And then as we get older, we, these sort of habits then crawl in and then all of a sudden like, oh, now I understand why I was going to bed at 10.30 because I feel way more refreshed the next day. Like, I've 100%. recovered probably. And then it, it's just mad that it takes that sort of know, learning period to then say, right, okay, now I'm going to look at my nutrition. I'm now mm. going to look at my training a bit better and just be feeling better altogether. Mm. Like, Again, I'd probably say there's a bit of a consensus at the moment that, and a probably a bit of a trend from the States that's come over to here now, is this whole view on alcohol. Probably everyone knows the UK for drinking a hell of a lot all the mm. time, like especially if we go up north or anything, not to stereotype and that type of stuff. Yeah. But now there seems to be more and more people saying, oh, I don't drink anymore. Like, yeah. There's just no need for it. I don't see what benefit this actually brings to me in terms of how I feel, how I perform and stuff like that. And it seems to be interesting that it's all changing as time goes on. Um, and as you're right, obviously, we look at people's adult, uh, adults and their nutrition and stuff, there just seems to be, well, I'd probably say a lack of cooking skills is probably yeah. one of them. It seems to be really quite prevalent. Uh, and it's also then passed on, obviously, from other sort of family members and stuff like that as well, yeah. where they've been in that similar sort of background where they haven't been able to sort of pass that on to there, mm. um, which is interesting. Uh, speaking of cooking skills, yourself, good cook, do you feel, or not really? I'm not, like, you know what? The One of the things that you say, kind of to answer your, your, that question with a comment on something you just said, which is like, one of the barriers to entry in terms of eating like a proper adult would be cooking skills. That's, it's, I mean, I'm no Gordon Ramsay, but I can cook chicken, rice. You know, rice I still struggle with, to be honest. <laughs> 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 Who doesn't? Who doesn't? Rice shit, is hard. Mate. Oh, shit. Rice, rice is hard. Potato, but but <laughs> chicken, beef, potatoes, sweet potatoes, vegetables it's so stupid easy it's this isn't something that you need to go on a two-day course for this is something that someone could show you in 10 minutes that you like it's almost an unfuck upable skill uh, i genuinely like to cook the basic stuff and i'm not talking about making some gourmet fancy you know michelin star dish i'm talking about cooking the basic fundamental foods that are going to be make up the, the majority of your diet Everyone can do that. And anyone saying, oh, I'm just a bad cook, you're just making up excuses for it. I genuinely believe that. I'm not a great cook, but, I can, but, but I've cooked for myself since I was, very, since I was quite young yep. because I w- was particular about what I wanted to eat. 
but my skills aren't incredible, but I can cook food, like basic, basic food, which, ev which is like a simple skill that everyone should have, um, and it isn't hard. Like most things, people go, I can't do this. I'm like, well, you haven't actually tried. <laughs> yeah. No, if you just yeah. try, like, there is, some of them are like, you can't cook chicken, potatoes, vegetables, th th enough for it to be palatable and perhaps even enjoyable, then you just haven't tried. I genuinely believe that. I, th I think you're true to the point with the fact that you're going to get Apart some... from rice. Rice is the <laughs> only exception. <laughs> <laughs> rice has a mind of its own. <laughs> sometimes it comes out great, sometimes it comes out shit. I don't know. Is that when you end up putting it back in the bucket so <laughs> yeah, it's gone exactly. wrong? It's like, right, at least we've yeah. got something you're used to this all yeah. of a sudden. Um, I think you're right to some degree in the sense that there's a sphere, I, I, again, speaking to a lot of different clients, that some of them won't try different foods at the fear of wasting food, right? And also the fact that it will then taste bad. And they have this kind of like fear. And I, I, do you know what? This fear can be somewhat to the same degree of someone trying to walk into the jiu-jitsu school feeling that they're going to get hurt instantly. Yeah. And it's then trying to overcome that barrier to say, actually, fine, go and give it a try. Go and see what happens. What's the worst that's going to happen? You just go and get something else in the meantime type yeah. of thing. And it's overcoming that, if you want to say, anxiety, which, again, I'm not yeah. in that sort of camp of everything being yeah. anxiety all the time of every different thing. But there's definitely limitations. We've all got the friends who doesn't have the boil of an egg, for example, right? Yeah. And you're just like, really? You have no idea on how to do this. And they're like, yeah, I've never been taught. And but you can learn this shit. You can. But then you've got to choose, you've got to put effort into to be able to do that. In the but first that's place. it. But like, when I talk about this, like, it's good for everyone. But I kind of come from the perspective as someone interested in their health and fitness. Yep. And if you say that you're interested in your health and fitness, then just do it. Mm. Like, there's no reason not to. Like, going to the gym for the first time is hard. Going to jujitsu for the first time is hard. Learn the cook for the first time is hard. Like, like way, if yeah. you want to get a black belt, you can't not go to the to the academy. If you want to get your nutrition in check, you can't not learn how to cook. If you want to be able to bench 200 kilos, you can't not set foot in the gym. Like, how badly do you want it? Because mm. you can't get somewhere if you're not willing to put in the work to do it. It's yeah. a simple, and, and that's true of everything. And like, that's just a that's just the reality of life. You don't get some. You, you, in life, you don't get given anything. On all the stuff that you you just get handed is not stuff that's going to be worth getting, right? It's like uh, if you try and give stuff away for free, you find that a lot of people don't want it. Because why would anyone want something that you can get for free? Yeah. But if something costs a lot of money, then people are willing to work financially invested to invest in that. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting what you were saying. It made me think of something earlier, which was we, we like grow up, we're taught all of these things, we have all of these things, these principles yep. that uh, uh, our parents and our schools and whatever, our elders attempt to ingrain in us, and then we hit this uh, threshold age of sort of puberty and independence, and we regress massively mm. because we are allowed to. For yeah. the first time in our lives, we're given independence and freedom. And I feel like there's two, you have to grow up twice. You have to grow up through someone else, be it the elders, the family, the schools, whatever. And then you restart life again at 15, 16, 17, 18, when you get that independence. And then you need to grow up, grow up by yourself. Mm. So you get, like, it, you're right, it happens to everyone. They get told what to eat. They've got to go to bed. They gotta do their homework. They gotta go play their sports. Mm. They gotta stay healthy. Yep. And then, and then you get the 15, 16, 17, and you sit in front of the TV all day. You eat junk food all day. You start smoking, drinking, drugs. You know all of that stuff. Yep. You you go to bed at four in the morning, like I used to do. Um, and then as you get older, you realize if I go to bed at four in the morning, I'm gonna be really tired tomorrow. Yeah. So then eventually. I, I used to go to bed at four and, and I was slow, and now I went to bed at fucking nine o'clock yesterday. Yeah. I mean, that's embarrassing even for me, but 10, 10, 10 30, yeah. I'm like heads on the pillow. Uh, you got to eat this, a meal prep all my food. Mm. You know, I, you, 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 I read every day. I do all of the stuff. So you go through the second, uh, the second growing up that you have to be self-driven to do. And the faster the, you can do that, the better. I was gonna say, but that's where the problem potentially comes in, where the people who have gone through a generation now of not looking after themselves mm. are then coming in and raising, let's say, children up in the same environment where they've not seen anything different, if you see what I mean. And then that issue of like not knowing how to cook yeah. is quite transparent because, again, the time we spend with our grandparents, for example, I think someone said the other day that, Oh, if you see your grandparents f f five times every year, for example, yeah. 
they have 10 years left, you're going to see them 50 yeah, times, like yeah. type of thing. It comes very small, quite yeah. realistic. The grandparents aren't going to spend the time obviously teaching these individuals how to cook. And if yeah. your parents don't know how to cook, don't get me wrong, it takes you a lot for you to become potentially the black sheep of the family to stand out and go, actually, I'm going to make a standpoint for this. Especially if, let's say, you're then cooking for yourself in the household where they're going, oh, we're just getting a Domino's tonight. Oh, you look a bit odd. Oh, don't worry about it. Mm. You can see where those sort of resistance and barriers comes up in mm. to try and obviously persist with it. But I, I think, I think, I mean, the one thing, if anything, that I feel like I was blessed with is not a zero desire to fit in with anyone. That's like yeah. from as long, as young as I know, uh, people thought I was some weird fucking kid and I liked it. I liked, I liked being a, an outlier yeah. and a lot of people don't. That's like more than anything else in my childhood which I didn't have a particularly exciting or, or exceptional childhood, the one thing that I'm appreciative of is that desire that I didn't give a shit what anyone thought of me. I didn't drink. I just still don't drink very much. Uh, but for all of those times when I, I would be the outcast, where most people would do everything in their power to fight their way back into the tribe, <laughs> I was very happy to be a, the lone wolf yeah. and, and, and not care. And then you find out all those lone wolves end up together and you know you get away call the tribe. Yeah. Uh, but, but what you're saying there, I think you're right, which... You can inherit, inherent, uh, inherit uh, skills, but also the lack of those skills. But in the same way that I'm saying that you get two growing up periods, that mm. first one, and then the second one, yeah. you can't blame your parents for the second one. No, you can't blame any, choice. that's yeah. you. Yeah. So once you get to the stage where your job of your parents really is to keep you alive, until you can keep yourself alive. Yeah. Right? And, and, and try and put you in the best position that they can when you are helpless. By the time you get past your uh, teens, you are now, for all intents and purposes, an adult, and you can look after yourself. Mm. Nobody should blame, and I understand that there are things that can happen in your childhood that can affect the rest of your life, but that's a decision that you have to make to like, am I gonna be a victim to, I was never taught how to cook they like to get takeaways. I'm like, you're, if you're 21 years old, fucking book on a cooking course. Go on, I mean, there's, go, go on, on YouTube, YouTube yeah. bro. <laughs> there's plenty of like meal I prep mean, guys like, on Instagram and stuff like that and girls. I mean, I mean, you almost can't not learn stuff. Yeah. Like we're in it, we're in truly in the age of information and probably to the detriment, there's a little bit too much of it. <laughs> it probably was a bit better maybe 10 years ago when there was just a select few. Uh, but there's no excuse not for doing any of this stuff. So get your shit together. Go fucking cook. cook your food, yeah. Well, a good question, obviously, being is that there's many black belts, obviously, out there mm. who may have not considered their nutrition at all type of thing. Um, do you think, again, one of the questions we had previously was, as a hobbyist, should I consider my nutrition? My response was, it will help with recovery. It's going to keep you on the map for much longer, just having some basic knowledge from there. But there's probably a big pool of people who just turn up to jits, have a bit of fun, and that's absolutely fine. It's a good crack. What's your thoughts on that? I don't think it's a jiu-jitsu thing or not a jiu-jitsu thing. Um, I think it's just like a life thing. Yeah. Like, do you want to be healthy? <laughs> do you yeah. want to like be the best version of yourself that you can be? I mean, some people are hedonistic, you know? They don't care. They just want to they wanna do stuff that they enjoy that's fun. It's just a different philosophy on life. Like, some people uh, just want to eat ice cream and uh, do drugs and party. And, you know, they, maybe they'll do a bit of jiu-jitsu, but that's just part of the fun. Uh, I don't feel like that. I feel the opposite I feel way. Like you're just Russell Brand at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the old Russell Brand. Uh, but you know, there, there's a you know a lot of people are hedonistic in their in their and maybe even unknowingly that they drive towards the immediate pleasure instead of driving towards perhaps the not pleasurable stuff that is going to le lead to an overall kind of holistic improvement of their life. So I think you go like, oh, should I, I'm, uh, I'm a jiu-jitsu hobbyist, should I take my nutrition and my sleep and my exercise seriously? I go, who gives a fuck whether you're a jiu-jitsu hobbyist or not? Like, do you want to be optimal at whatever you want to do? Mm. Maybe you just want to lift weights. Maybe you want to run. Maybe you want to cycle. Maybe you want to do jiu-jitsu. Maybe you want to box. Maybe you want to climb. It doesn't matter what you do. If you're serious about all of the stuff that's sort of um, a satellite to 
the, 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 the core stuff that you want to do, if you improve or you optimize all of that stuff, your life in general would just be better. Yeah, it's, it's again a very interesting thing that we do with a lot of people where we get people coming to us and say, I want to be in the lower weight category and I want to be shredded and jacked and all this type of stuff. Yeah. So that's great, we can achieve that, but what we're actually going to do is actually level you up as a human being where you're going to be more productive for your job, let alone everything else, your relationships, your confidence levels are going to go through the roof, not yeah. just from the physical change, but the ability to say, it's like, I don't know, hitting that perfect Kimura, right, from yeah. a certain position, and then you go, oh, this works. And that mm -hmm. confidence has just peaked a little bit mm -hmm. more. And then you build on that again and again and again. And then you, you get to the point of then saying, okay, fine, we've now done this with yourself personally. What else do you want to go and venture out into type mm -hmm. thing and encourage people from there? And it's, again, something which I have many conversations with people saying, okay, fine, you've done this sport for ever so long thinking that this was the most optimal for my health or, I don't know, weight loss or something like this. And they kind of go, I don't enjoy this one bit. Yeah. And I'm like, well, this is because we've shown you all the other attributes to your life we can improve and level up. And they go, yeah, I'm going to give up on CrossFit now. I'm going to go and do slacklining. Or something. Yeah. Like, you go do you, boo. Like, that's fantastic. So at least you're going to go enjoy it type yeah. of thing. And then you're going to feel like you can go and find other things. But I'm not proud of this. We've had people break up from relationships because they realize this is not what they wanted. Mm -hmm. This is not the lifestyle I wanted. People change their jobs all of a sudden or going to set their own business or something like that. Mm. And it's just interesting in how when you look at lifestyles and how you can impact mm. that and how much more people can then grow from there and then overcome so many other different hurdles in life type thing, which is really cool. 100%, yeah. Like nothing nothing in life works in isolation. <laughs> Everything's part of a, uh, that sort of life ecosystem. If something's out of whack, then it's going to have an effect on the rest of the stuff. In the same way, if something's positive, it will have a positive effect on the rest of the stuff. Yeah. So I'm going to touch on the fact that obviously meal prep, uh, Dan, has only been around for like, the last couple of years. I think you said it was well, no, probably months was it or yeah months sorry um a few months what was the preparation like for your big competitions then yeah um the big matches stuff well like i've been competing for a long time so um you know it's going to be dependent on the time but like for the most part like pretty good I, I honestly i can't i can't remember specifics but just like eating pretty good um my my diet i feel like has got cleaner as time has gone on mm. probably in line with my metabolism going down uh ha it like sort of almost a bit of a necessity i was gonna say technically metabolism is about 55 54 it starts dropping off so yeah. you still got a little while to go i don't know i feel like it might <laughs> a little bit. uh maybe not until it's gone off the cliff <laughs> <laughs> slow decline um yeah just like like pretty good like uh, since my early 20s i've eaten pretty well yeah. yeah, I'd say, yeah. So there'd be nothing that sort of change on the up to competitions, fueling yourself more, anything like that at all? Um, not really, not no. really. I mean, uh, there's no, there's not really a lot of peaking stuff. Maybe like I'll go carb, a little bit more carb heavy in the week leading up to it, stuff like that. Um, I, I haven't cut a lot of weight ever. I mean, like the last time I probably cut weight was in 2000. 12 maybe so get nasty flashbacks to it it's like a long time ago <laughs> yeah. yeah like my my weight uh i struggle to keep weight up yeah so i can lose weight very easily very like easy. very easily with that cut do you know what i'm asking was there any what, what sort of techniques did you go down to was it just reduction i just did a water cut water cut and that was oh, yeah it. and i can be at naga under 80 80 kilos maybe and i was weighing 85 and i did five in the sauna so was that oh so five minutes okay so sauna so it wasn't a like water load they, or anything they, they, like no that. just did five in the sauna super like nothing fancy nothing high okay, tech cool. yeah. that's fine obviously with the check obviously the structure of competitions now changing there's obviously a lot more day before weigh-ins coming out within jiu-jitsu in particular i'd say and it's one of the concerns that I have is that to mm. the hobbyist who sees that, I don't know, I use Jacob Couch as a perfect example, shifting 14.7 yeah. kilograms in three days. Did he really? Yes. Yeah. For grapple? No, this was for uh, who's next. Yeah. Uh, no, who's number one, I think it was. Yeah, who's number it one. Was it was number one. in a Grand Prix style when he shifted that in. 14 kilos? 14.7 in three days. Kilos? Yeah. 30 pounds? Yeah. yeah. And in then, days. yeah, and so, my concern is, obviously, he said he had a purpose, he had obviously had money involved and obviously like this and everything and wants obviously on the biggest stage, great opportunity, bit of a fairly decent reason, to say the least, but at the same time, he went in and got an IV afterwards and stuff like that to try and get things better. Uh, the irony behind it is that you saw both Rotolo brothers coming out from an IV drift straight, out, straight afterwards as well um, really? in the same building and it was like, and this is all on Daisy Fresh, I think, on the yeah. first episode of the new season. 
the problem I, I have concern is that to the average person or the average jiu-jitsu person watching that goes, oh, you can shift 14.7 in three days. Maybe I should do the same thing without the actual understanding of it being day before weigh-in. Yeah. And it's not a safe protocol to be trying to do, especially with, I don't know, your local competition, same day weigh-in. It's not something we should be trying to encourage in the slightest bit. And Yeah, people have always been really dumb um, with... Uh, weight cutting. Way yeah, people, <laughs> people are really stupid. Uh, I remember back in 2008, I was in Brazil, walking around Brazil with a, a, an American a friend of mine uh, who trained at Rogers at the time, looking for diuretics because he had to shit out five kilos or something. Wow. And they don't speak English very well in Brazil. <laughs> we're there I love like, that description. We were there like this. We're just like, we need... <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, that's true. We were like in a pharmacy like... Trying to mime uh, diarrhea. <laughs> he was un unsuccessful at finding it, and I can't remember how he cut the weight in the end. But yeah, pe pe people are ge uh, just generally pretty stupid in terms of what they do to try and cut weight. But then usually they're kind of a couple of kilos. And it's mm. like, you know what, who gives a shit? Like, you're, you're going to learn this the hard way, or you're going to learn, you know, just, I don't know, the whole weight cutting thing, it's just never, it's never re I've never really related with it too much. No. No, I did. A, when I was younger, I, I did. I was like very strict in my diet. Um, with a, Like I have done. I mean, now we're talking. I competed in the first ever World No Gi, which was <laughs> 2007, I think. And uh, yeah, it was 2007, first ever World, World No Gi in California. And uh, I was competing at under, I was competing at 66 kilos. And we were weighing every single thing we consumed for like the three or four days leading up to it. Yeah. So I mean, like, you step on the scales, check. Okay, I want this glass of water. You step on the scales with a glass of water. <laughs> Too much, it's quite bad. Okay, we're gonna have a sip. I remember going to El Polo Loco, uh, a chicken place. I got two chicken uh, wings, two, just a pack of two chicken wings. <laughs> and I, it looked like you dropped these chicken wings in a fish tank of piranhas. Every <laughs> morsel of flesh, gone. sinew and tendon had been sucked dry off of these things. Uh, so that sort of stuff, those were like, like really, to be honest, after that even, I was 16 at the time, I was like, cutting weight's kind of dumb, I'm just gonna compete out for weight whenever I'm close to. That's awesome to hear. Like it's, it's, again, this big encouragement, I think, I, again, I've done a few reels on this in particular about how smooth comp with some of the competitions now will register the weight of everyone in yeah. the category once they've stepped on the scales. And if you look back over it, average people are about 1.5 to 2 kg under the bracket. Yeah. And I'm there like, okay, fine, you're competing at 97, yeah. let's say, and you're, floating at 93 right yeah. you're like oh i might go to 91 and i'm like okay well you could do if you've got time but at the same time you go from 97 we take away 1.5 right we're down down to 95.5 yeah you fuel yourself up and eat a bit more for that competition you're going from 93 to 94 yeah you're worried about one and a half kilograms difference yeah and like okay there's gonna be some outliers who are gonna hit bang on the money at 97 and have done obviously things to get that but you're gonna be way more fueled way more hydrated and everything like that and i'm like if I paired you up with everybody in the gym who's 1.5 kilograms heavier than you, are you going to give a fuck? Not at all no. in the slightest bit. Yeah, it seems to be, let's try and drop down weight all the time. Let's try and drop down weight all the time. And don't get me wrong, if you in the wrong body composition, I'm not to say there's like endomorphs, ectomorphs, and all that type of stuff, but if you're just overweight for your category, for your height type yeah. thing, it's going to work in your favor because you're, I don't know, Five foot three and 130 kilograms, yeah. I mean, that sounds pretty powerful at the moment. <laughs> what more wrong with that person? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, who's the guy you were talking about earlier? It was six foot, how tall was he? And 25 Six foot stone? 10 and 150 kilos. Yeah, 150 kilos and six foot 10, then yeah. Okay. Right. He's, he's going to be in one category. There's no chance of getting under it. No, you're right, you're right. It is, uh, I think, look, if you're within a couple of kilos, you, you, you're right in that a lot of people, a lot of hobbyists who are competing in a local jiu-jitsu competition with same-day weigh-ins will watch a professional MMA fighter or a professional grappler cut multiple tens of pounds uh, in the day beforehand and then look awesome the next day after getting an IV and all the other stuff uh, and think that they can do something similar. You, what are you doing, you fucking lunatic? Like, just If you're a couple of kilos heavier in the weight division, then spend a month slowly dropping your calories and cutting your carbs a little bit and just come in close to the weight and then don't eat breakfast or something or don't have dinner the night beforehand. But if you're like three or four kilos above, so you're two kilos under the weight division above, uh, you know, the limits, you, you, you're deep into your weight division. If you think cutting four kilos is gonna make you win that tournament, 
but if going up a weight division you're going to lose, well then you probably just suck. And you should just do the weight division. Just get better at jiu-jitsu and just win your weight division. Get like, better oh. at that jiu-jitsu. That's just get better at like, like, <laughs> like, like, what, you're 96 kilos and you want to cut to under 94 instead of competing at under 97. Like, just be good enough to win your division and you don't have to worry about it. There we go. I love that. I love that. <laughs> Um, well, obviously, we'll probably move away from the diet stuff and yeah, okay, yeah. for a little sure. bit, obviously, from there. Uh, we've got some good little sound bites there for certain, that's it. Just be better at jiu-jitsu um, <laughs> rather than going back about, about, about going down to weight. Well, do you know what? Do you know what? From, from a, if you look at it on a, from a different perspective, you're focusing on the wrong thing. Mm. You know, one of the things I always remember, last thing I was saying, wait, on the few times that I did cut weight, I like that I cut weight another time. I'll tell you what, I'll tell this story. Yeah, go for it. important one. The next time I cut weight was the first ever tournament I did as a black belt. Um, and I competed a medium heavy, uh, so it was 85. 84 oh. in the Rash Garden shorts, uh, World No Gi. And that was hot. I mean, I was, I was like 90 kilos at the time, or like high 80s, 90 kilos. And I'd cut down to 84. And I felt so depleted for the week leading up to it. Whenever you cut a lot of weight like that, and you're to, to the point where it's consuming your mind, mm. um, you step on the scales, you weigh in, and you feel a sense of victory. And then you realize that now you've got to actually do the tournament. Because your brain is not focused on the correct thing. Yeah. You're not focused on what you should be focusing on, which is the jiu-jitsu. You're focusing on trying to make weight. That's the, o the only thing I thought about in the five days leading up to World No Gi that year was making weight. weight. Not about what's my game plan, what visualizing the first step, all of that stuff that I should have been focusing on, I'm only focusing on making weight. Take that out of the equation and like from a bigger perspective, don't focus on your weight, focus on your jiu-jitsu is a good general rule. I can relate to it a lot and I've said this a couple of times before, my first few competitions obviously, being a nutritionist yeah. and registered and all that type of stuff, my biggest fear was nutritionist doesn't make weight yeah. and I was like oh. and that would be my honestly my first big battle because everyone was like are you okay you're fine there's no problem and I'm like oh everyone knows what I do I can't be doing it I've got to make weight type thing this is going to be the biggest now thing now you can ever. just play it off as like uh, I'm doing an experiment yeah <laughs> I'll use that for the next time um, but again it's like I said it's all interesting to see and it's good to hear about these stories type of yeah. thing that Unfortunately, like I said, you get some little snippets from Mikey Musameshi saying he was absolutely basically passing out on the map before obviously going mm. into the world and stuff like this and still still winning, which is which is good, obviously, from that point of view. But at the same time, it's like how much better would he have been if he was obviously properly... Yeah, and for all of those, there's like five guys who were passing out who like didn't win. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Felt like shit. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mikey Musameshi trains like eight to nine hours a day. Yeah, he's... Yeah. he's, he's Yeah. So the reason you can eat seven pizzas, eight pastas. He, he's, he's an interesting character, just Jeff, because obviously I get a lot of questions about this thing. Oh, it's fast and the best thing. Like, how can you eat pizza and pasta every day and everything like this? And I said, look, at the end of the day, none of us are going to be aware of fully how that dynamic setup is unless you follow him around with a camera 24 7, right? Yeah. And it's the point of then saying that. Once you understand the full picture of it, like again, I'm sure we've all had it before. The friend who never seems to put on any weight and seems mm. to eat whatever they want. It's like, well, yeah, they've just gone out for an all-you-can-eat type thing, but they didn't eat for the two days prior to yeah. that type of thing. And not intentionally, but that's just their hat character, their habits yeah. and characteristics. And so Mikey, again, if he's training for that amount all of a sudden, for mm. him to get that amount of obviously calories in there, it's going to be a completely different ball game. And yeah. it's somewhat, I know we're going back to the nutrition here, but it's not the end of the world. It's the same thing with like Craig Jones was talking about when he's working with Jordan Sullivan, obviously from the fight dietitian, about how for him to get the right amount of calories on board, he had to actually somewhat go down the processed food route yeah. a little bit to get the volume up enough to add to then. And then Craig reported less injuries, less staph infection, yeah. all these type of things. And so there's a fine balance to every individual mm. and that you can't ever even get a snippet of it. It's not a true reflection of what's going on. Like we could have your meal plan yeah. Yeah, that you're following at the moment. Yeah. That's applicable to you yeah. and your daily routine, right? Yeah. Your daily routine could change, let's say, when you're out doing seminar tours, yeah. and all of a sudden your requirements are completely different again. Mm. And it's just a forever dynamic environment that's ever changing. Mm. So, um, one of the things obviously we're going to talk about here is there's a lot of talk, obviously, with people popping for steroids at mm. the moment. Um, what's your sort of thoughts and feelings on it all in terms of 
is IBJJF doing the right thing and obviously in testing people? Um, is it kind of them doing a disservice where it's going to shift people onto the LECT platform more? Um, so, I mean, I remember a time before IBJJF did any testing. I'm not, the, the testing with the IBJJF is a little bit, I feel like it, there's a, it's a little bit dodgy. It's a bit casual from what I can see. Because, no, I think that they, they get, like, I think they go for USADA, they do it properly, but then they get the results. I don't think, I don't, or this how, it, I know that this is how it was at one point where you would kind of, they would hold the results in their pocket until you upset them. And then really? they would come out. Like blackmail? Something Not blackmail, but they were just like, you keep IBJJF happy and maybe your test never comes out. You know, you see a lot of people, their tests coming out sometimes over a year after they first pop. Yeah. You know? So, like, some interesting stuff like that. Um, but I don't know what's going on there. And I don't know if that's still the case now. Um, should IBJJF uh, test? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I think, I think it's nice... To with so many people testing, you know, pop it now. I think maybe people take it more seriously. Like obviously, a lot of people don't. Mm. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't still get in tests like the fight sports guys, cyborg and, and and Wagner and stuff like that. I think that it's nice to have a place for natural athletes to feel like they can compete against other other natural athletes. Um, so yeah, I don't think I, I, you you can never say that a, a organization is being wrong for trying to be fairer. If they, if that is actually, if they're doing it legitimately, no, there's nothing wrong with that. I think the only concern that I have is, like I said, as a, uh, a participant, obviously jujitsu, obviously spectator, and obviously big fan of it, is that I just feel that there's going to be this very much this separation now, quite distinctively of going, you're either in the natural comp, yeah, or the unnatural comp, and that with ADCC set up at the moment, it seems to be a lot of more up to date media coverage of the individuals who are taking part in it. Whereas IBJJF, obviously, it's kind of, okay, unless you're at the world and you do the flying armbar, yeah. all of a sudden, you're just another name on the board. Yeah, well, it's like uh, ADCC's Mr. Olympia, not uh, in terms of, not because they actually look like they're bodybuilders, although a lot of them so do. So C-bum at the next one, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I mean, we had Gigi Mufu at one of the uh, opens did. recently. Yes. Uh, the, it's like the Olympia and then the IBJJF is sort of like, whatever the natural bodybuilding equivalent is that nobody knows about or cares about. Um, <laughs> so does that mean you're, is that, so you don't care about IBJJF? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, you're right. It's not, the, the, the ADCC is the show. It is mm. the show. Um, and, they're, and everyone's juiced to fuck. You know, what are you going to do? It's a tough one. No, it really is a tough it, one. The, 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 the steroid problem in jiu-jitsu is a really tough one. Um, and uh, I mean like I, I feel it now more than ever I'm in my early 30s and you know I do a hard training session and I'm fucking wrecked mm. I do everything right like my sleep's on point like I try to do everything I can for my sleep my diet's really good like my recovery stuff is good I'm like how the fuck do these people train three times a day <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> honestly like it's like it, it is crazy and um, but it's one of those things where what do you do? You start testing ADCC and then either everyone pops or no I sure. mean, there was like a, or, or everyone looks very different. Yeah. Everyone looks very different, but it's, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's a, the sports in a bit of a weird state now where it's kind of becoming like a lot of people who you don't even expect to pop like Mika, like stuff like that. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, that are popping, you know, what are you going to do about it? I don't know. It's, it's, it's like a, it's a really tricky situation, obviously, to try and manage it all together. I think um, after doing my dissertation on steroid users within mm. the bodybuilding world at university, and that there was a quite a clear transparency that I think it was like 93% of people would not speak to their GP about their steroid use really? to get that support. Wow. And when we look at what's coming through, obviously, with people, what they're popping with, I think obviously one of the jiu-jitsu athletes was taking trend, wow. I think, was to... Put it I mean, into perspective. I, get a list of what, I know exactly who Yeah, you're and he, he was on a. Something, I think it was like seven to eight compounds. Wow. In a stack. Of yeah, he didn't even win. No, he didn't win yeah. at all. And, and, to think, and to think, and to think, it was all just from tainted supplements. Yeah, yeah. Assay yeah. and Jesus. Assay and Jesus. Assay yeah. and Jesus. Well, I had no idea. Is, <laughs> the weird thing is with my BJJ app. Do you know how it works if a champion gets popped? Oh, a silver medalist gets the gold medal. Yeah, so this so is, that this changes is, the, the... This is the argument with, with the Rotolo brothers, wasn't yeah. it? Yes. About how I wouldn't want to get default world... Like, do you know what I mean? That's you wouldn't? 
Fuck it. No, no, no. Like, it's the no, same I'm thing as like. I, the only medal I hold is a default bronze. <laughs> and I can tell you now, when my little six year old came up to me and said, Dad, did you win? I went, Yeah, fuck it. <laughs> I can never believe it. No. They are meant to say, like, Did you win a medal? Nah. No, I was, a- I was anti Aljamain Sterling after he got his belt from the DQ. And That's everything. different though. It's That's different. What, That's different. World level status? <laughs> like. No, it's different. I think, uh, you know, if Reluto is a natural athlete and he's lost in a final against someone who's on steroids and they've been, they've been popped, that's right. He's the champion. The guy, the guy, the guy they fought got disqualified for cheating. <laughs> like, yeah. as simple as that. I mean, like, imagine, like, what if in the middle of the match, the blood results come back and they call him up and they're, whoa, 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 halfway match. whoa, 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 whoa. It's done, it's done. He's, he, he's on the <laughs> I here. would like to see that. Huh? A DQ happen mid match. Like, <laughs> didn't that happen recently with, like, um, Ah, uh, what was it? I think I've seen two. One was where he was being Ezekiel choked and ran off the map at the same time. They really? decused him yes. from evading the submission. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. And there was something else, I think, with two women fighting again where mid-match the, the, it was reversed, I think, in terms of points. I can't remember which one. Sorry, yeah, this is another so, key yeah. one. Yeah, so you yeah. probably they switched up. up. Like, I think I've only used smooth comp, but I'm sure it's a similar premise where you have to click to put the points in and the ref will points realise that the scores uh, were the yeah. wrong way around. Yeah, but the, the woman celebrated to so say that she won, won already. They won and they went, oh, hang on a minute, and flipped the yeah, score around and the other woman won. It's awful. Yeah, it's not it's great. You I'm imagine be... prepping six months for Worlds, yeah. mm. get to that point, and you're like, yes, hands been raised and then no actual. Yeah, but, yeah, but then, but I mean, when, when she had a, when she got taken down, had a guard pass and mounted. <laughs> <laughs> and she was up by six points. <laughs> there should have been some red flags. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't argue with them, would you? You'd be like, it's not my problem. No, I think no. you'd probably be. But yeah, I mean, there was a, wasn't there a Tour de France one year where the entire thing was basically cancelled because every single person popped yes. the steroids? Yeah, this yeah. is my argument is the fact that we'll always be chasing, the you started seeing we'll always be chasing because they're not going to be government funded. Funded, obviously, they're not going to go against the government funded schemes where people can obviously put as much obviously stuff in there to get around the testing procedure. And then from there, they're obviously going to be funded in a very small comparison to, like I said, Russian states, Russo. Do you know what I mean? You'll never yeah. really catch up to it ever. Um, I mean, like ADCC could, uh, ADCC could do it if they wanted to, of course. You just, test the, you just test the winners. I mean, like, yeah, everyone would just cycle off. But I don't know. Yeah, it does struggle. Then there's the other old, old, age, old, old age argument of saying, right, we'll just let them all get on as much juice as possible. Well, that's, that's what we do. Yeah. That is, then, what, that is what ADCC is. Yeah. It's like pride. It's like yeah. it's in your contract that you have to take steroids. Yeah. It's the 100 metre final work, everyone on, on juice type thing. It's just see how yeah. fast you yeah. yeah. Bolt's yeah. record yeah. goes out the window. The thing is, though, <laughs> is like, you know, talking of pride and that, it's like, I'll mention Alistair Overeem because I, I thought he was fucking fantastic. And all right, I know he's on steroids and that, but he is a legit kickboxer. Like he'll, he'll no one's kick. saying that these guys at ADCC no, aren't no. legit. They're just the best guy. They're the best jujitsu guys in the world, yeah. and they're on steroids. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it doesn't make him any what like no. steroids don't make you it better than jujitsu. Because yeah. like you know, there's a, there's a lot of hate towards Gordon Ryan. I think he's cool. Like I like his jits. Like it's actually I like his actual. Um, he's undeniably the greatest grappler in the world. I, well, actually, let's speak about Gordon Ryan. Apparently, there's a letter that you wrote to him. No, 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 yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. no, not a letter. Dan wrote a story. It was story. Open, it was a it was an ended letter. It, yeah. No, it was a uh, it was a story. It was in the voice of Gordon Ryan as well. It was it was, it was I wrote a letter as Gordon Ryan. Lovely. Divulge. I haven't I haven't heard it all. Oh fucking hell! As soon as I get my phone, I mean, it's a long story. You wouldn't want it on the podcast, but uh, <laughs> basically, I competed in EBI. I competed, it, so this is, I think I competed in EBI in like 2014 or 15. Yeah. Uh, EBI 9, yeah. Who yeah. Gordon was originally meant to be in it. And at the time, he was like, not Gordon, Gordon, but he was like coming up, it's when he was doing a lot of challenge matches, it was all, you know, on money on the line and stuff like that. It was all about the money. Yeah. Um, and they, the EBI came and filmed with me here, and I said something like, it's not about the money, it's about, you know, the, the, the title. Which was true, it meant more to me. And then uh, he ended up actually pulling out of the event, and Gary took his place and won. And like maybe two months later, maybe even longer, he just writes a, he writes a Facebook status, which was, uh, "It's not about the money. It's about blah blah blah." blah from like as a quote from me, someone who was never going to win anyway. And I just thought <laughs> like the, I saw it and I laughed. And I thought, why the fuck has this come out of absolutely nowhere? So I just like, what is going on in Gordon Ryan's head? So I just sat down and I mean, the muses 
entered me and <laughs> just like it the words were pouring out i was like never it was like the the greatest flow star i've ever been in my life and i just wrote this fucking long story as gordon ryan um <laughs> and you know he wakes up it was it was the, the the idea was how does he get to this stage and at the time like Danaher had just come on Instagram. Gordon was walking around with his fuck with a crown everywhere. It was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, so it was like, uh, you know, Gordon wakes up and you know shouts down to his mum for bacon, and then, you know, <laughs> and then gets upset because uh, because he was in he was at Polaris with Gary, but no one was paying him attention because Gar he was there were there for Gary, and he gets upset about it. And he throws his Burger King crown across the room, but. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't break because it's plastic and then all this stuff and he like gets online and he wants to antagonize some people but then he remembers that John Danaher has told him that he can't because they they were told that they weren't allowed to fight with the uh, uh, Colson Grace uh, oh. with the Marcelo Garcia guys because uh, yeah, yeah. they were having this back and forth so he goes ah oh, I've got another idea <laughs> but I, I posted that and Gordon came on and was just like you got me you got me really like, yeah, yeah he was just like yeah, I've, got, I've got nothing for that yeah, uh, like, Gary and Gordon, they're all laughing at it. Uh, but yeah, that was that was good crap. That was years ago now. So you technically won up over Gordon then? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I might have the last. I might have the last uh, big victory over him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Gordon, you may be undefeated, but in the yeah, yeah, yeah. in the troll world, yeah. <laughs> it's a different. I beat you story. at a lit literary battle any day of the week. I love it. Any predictions that actually came true when your little story? Did you put anything into the future? For uh, no, not really. No, not really. No, no, that would no. be a funny Mystic no. Matt moment. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I predict these things. I yeah. love it. Um, cool. How are we doing for time, mate? What are we at? Yeah, time we're good. We are on one hour fourteen. Nice. nice. So cool. we've got some questions to go through. Ah, oh, let's go for it. Oh man, we've got tons of questions. Hit me. Hit tons of questions. So, first one is your post-competition food. What is your go-to? So I know you're a bit of, well, through the Instagram, you do like cheat meals back in the day. Yeah, about, oh, way back in the day, yeah, yeah, when I used to, God, fucking hell, you really did sort me a long oh, time yeah. ago. Oh, yeah. that is, oh, I haven't posted <laughs> cheat meals in fucking ages. Cookies a lot. I yeah, cookies are good, brownies, ice cream, yeah. ice cream. So that, uh, the, the story that I told you where I cut weight for, for my first black belt, World No Gi, um, I weighed in at 84 and I weighed uh, 88 the next day. But I didn't do a water cut. That was just fucking ice cream. That was four kilos of ice cream. <laughs> uh, I bought all of this food and I just just gorged myself afterwards. Yeah, probably uh, ice cream. Ice cream. Ice cream, ice maybe cream. cookies. What flavour ice cream? All of them. All of them? All of them. Honey, my, my favourite one was a chocolate honeycomb. Ooh. No, none of that Neapolitan yeah. shit. That you no, uh, uh, no. Anyone that's Not like pistachio. Like the chocolate in Neapolitan... No, 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 no. Sorry. So yeah, I like, uh, I like, uh, I like ice cream. I do. So after obviously big fight, then we're off to an ice cream parlor of some sort, basically. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. What do I usually have after a big fight? Usually, big competition. You're hungry, but to be honest, do you know what it is? Is, um, it's similar to you mentioned alcohol, and it's like that. It's like it's not about what it's like when you consume it. It's about how it makes you feel afterwards. Yep. And as much as I love the taste of ice cream, it makes me feel shit. Mm. Like once, I mean, literally two minutes after I eat it, it no longer feels good and it just feels shit for half an hour. Yeah. Whereas if I go out and I have like a massive plate of sushi, mm. it feels pretty good when I eat it. I feel great afterwards. Yeah, fair, fair. So I'd probably, I'd like, I'd probably just get, this fucking sounds so boring. Yeah. Vanilla ice cream with a, with with a cone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One plain cone. <laughs> no no flake. No it. Like, it would be some ice cream with like a scoop of ice uh, It would be a plate of sushi with like a scoop of ice cream in the end. Nice. <laughs> well, it's interesting you mentioned about that. It's like, again, bad. Like, I cannot stand coffee. Right. Yeah, I don't drink coffee. Don't though. drink it at coffee. You may judge me in a complete way. I probably have one can of Ultra Monster a day, okay. right? So I really enjoy the flavours for it. I do judge and, you. Oh yeah, don't worry. I'll probably be getting banned. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and, get out! <laughs> <laughs> um, and one time when my friends were like, why don't you try it with gin? Monster and gin. See what this is like. And I thought, alright, cool. I think it was about two or three years ago on a bank holiday. And I was like, right, this is going. I was going for all the flavours. Got absolutely hammered on the stuff. I got yeah. really hung over the next day. Problem is, came to the following Monday, I started working and everything. Went to oh, have my 11s no. is, and I smelt the monster. I was like, Ugh, yeah, yeah, Ugh. yeah. And I was like, this is a hangover. And I was like, I couldn't touch it for like two weeks. And yeah. eventually, it came back to normality. And we I mean, I did that. Uh, I, the mo video might still be out there. There was a place near our old gym uh, that was a milkshake place. 
and I love me a milkshake. And they, they had a record. You know how they, this is like, it's very common these days, but back in the day it was kind of a bit of a novelty where you'd go and they'd put chocolate bars or whatever you wanted yeah. in this milkshake. And uh, we were, I was in there, I was chatting, and I'm like, what's the, what's the most number of, and there'd be like 10 milkshakes, 10 chocolate bars, something like that. And I went in, and I think it was 50 chocolate bars I wanted. Uh, I was like, I wanted to break this record, and I got 50 chocolate bars, and uh, but they kind of fucked it up. They put so much that it ended up being five large milkshakes, Shakes, yeah. and I drank all of this. I felt so bad, so sick. I mean, I didn't have to eat for three days afterwards because I had so many calories. Uh, surprised I wasn't diabetic afterwards, but I didn't drink uh, milkshakes for like two or three years, and I love milkshakes. Oh wow! Yeah. Now, you need to go see beers. Have you watched Beers Meets Food on YouTube? Yes. I love that guy. Literally, school, yeah, yeah. every time. What's the next question we got, then, mate? We got a couple. Yep. Um, one of them that will make Dan smile is, uh, I want to ask you about chess. Okay. I know you're a big proponent about chess. Yeah. And your current ELO is, from what I checked the other day, 1310, I think it was recently. No. no my, I got to 1500. Really? Blitz. And then I stopped playing. That was about a year ago. Ah. Because it would ruin my day so much. Yeah. Uh, if I was doing badly, I would be in a bad mood. If I was doing well... I wouldn't even be in a good mood. Yeah. It was just if I was doing badly, yeah, yeah. I'd be in a terrible <laughs> mood. And it would affect my day and like my relationships with my friends and family. Uh, so I was like, you know what? I'm going to get to 1500 and I'm going to step away. And I did. And now I play, I still play all the time. Mm. Like, not all the time. I play usually every day for a, for a couple of games, short games. But I just play it unranked. Yeah. 1500. Yeah. 1500. It's pretty damn good. Oh, it's it okay. Is. It's okay. Is only because I mentioned it? Because um, I know you've mentioned a couple of times you want to do a competition yes. where you do jiu jitsu. And do chess afterwards. Yes, that's right. When's that coming? So my, I, I actually mentioned it about a year and a half ago. It was like winter 21 when I was speaking about it. Um, and my plan was, I was hoping that I'd be opening up a gym the next year. And I, so basically my plan was to have a chat. So I put out uh, applications. I got a load back. I still got that information, uh, like all of those details. And then uh, I wanted to do like a chess grappling open map just like to get people to test out the format that I wanted to do it as and then from there move on to doing a show uh, but I got taught I haven't, just haven't managed to do that find the right place like just been busy with all the stuff to be honest but a friend of mine Adisa Benjoko who is a uh, big ch- jiu jitsu guy chess guy way way bigger in chess than I am um, and I mean I'm nothing in chess I'm just fucking casual um, but he is like working on it a little bit and I mean like some actual big names. Mm. Um, I mean, I don't think we'll get a lot of them, but we're talking about, obviously, Roger's really into chess, yeah, like super into yeah. chess. Um, and the, 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 so Adisa has connections with Wu-Tang Clan, so Riza and Jizza, who are both big into chess. Big. So po- really we're possibly big. getting uh, Roger versus Jizza. Oh shit! That'd be not, so not doing jujitsu, but just as a, like a yeah, suit. that'd be good too. And then, and then there's, talk, there's talks of getting like Riza versus Manny Pacquiao and some mad shit like that. Uh, but but we're, 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 it's in the works. But I've good, got good connections with uh, production teams from Polaris and Enyo. So yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Well, that's interesting. We're thinking about doing something at the moment, so we we'll have to. It shows, yeah. I can put, I can put you, I can put you in touch with people about doing running grappling shows. Yeah, I mean it's a thankless task, just so you know up front. Uh, yeah. But but if you want to do, it, I can put you in so, touch with people. Yeah, we'll, we'll have a chat with you after this. We've yeah, got cool. some something specific we want to do. Yeah. Um, so we've got a couple of other ones. Uh, some of them from Instagram. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> I might have to take this off and put this towards you if you're asking. No, 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 you're fine. I'm, just, I'm, I'm being picked up. I can see it's going. It's fine. Um, so, specifically, uh, a female. Okay. Yeah. So, you see this is going already. Has asked, where do you train? Why aren't you closer to me? And how can I find you? <laughs> so, it depends on how much information you want to give for her. But, uh, they are an RGA member. I'll put it that way. So... Uh, Dan for a seminar please contact him just message you know yeah. I'm on Instagram at, yeah. Ros- at raspberry underscore eight shoot shot shoot shot yeah, how's your Riz that's the question yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah you got I'll get your checks yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, another one was have you got any predictions for flow grappling for tonight oh versus who's fighting tonight Nicholas Mirabali versus Pedro Mourinho uh, Pedro Mourinho in the gi oh, first time. the gi I don't fucking give a shit alright we're going to the other one <laughs> 
Well, the, the other one will work. Uh, like Jacob Couch versus Isaac Mitchell. Oh, that's good. Oh, that sounds way better. Do I have any predictions? Mm. Uh, I've heard a lot of really... I mean, Isaac's really good. Obviously, Jacob's really good as well. Um, oh, no predictions. Uh, should be a good match, though. Yeah, nice. that sounds good. Sounds good. There's a um, couple more on that card, but I can't remember off the top of my head. What's that? There's a couple more on that card, but I can't remember off the top of my head. No, I can't remember. That's really bad. I know you should probably look that up at some point. Oh, I'm, um, I'm terrible at following pro grappling. So terrible. We've got some slightly deeper questions now. Oh, okay. But they're all good. Okay. So we want to know, and we ask quite a few people this, uh, something that your viewers don't know about you. God, I've done a lot of podcasts. I've spoken a lot in my time. Something that they don't know about me. Uh... As a man in the spotlight, it's very difficult. To it's very hard, it. isn't it? Yeah. Um, fuck me. I actually don't know. You can come back to it. Yeah, maybe you can come back to it. I feel like I'm not going to be able to give a good answer. Because I've got to filter it through things that are just interesting. Yeah. Filtered over things that I've already mentioned. <laughs> I mean, the number of hours of recorded um, audio of me talking in interviews, be it my own and other people's, were probably in like well into the thousands. Mm. So there's probably not a huge amount <laughs> that not someone know, out there knows yeah, about yeah, me. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think That's it's right. something. I mean, like, if, if you went to like, uh, the, some people might not know about me, the Ninja Warrior one's pretty good. It's a good tip. Yeah, it's a good yeah. tidbit. I mean, like, if they were in the scene a few no. years ago. Did I was you on, not? I was, in yeah. Ninja, I was on Ninja Warrior. Yeah. yeah. I was on Ninja Warrior in, in, in oh, I'm not sure when it was, a few years back. Season one, episode one. Yeah. Yep. How'd you do? Uh, oh, terribly. Uh, but kind of like, um, like I didn't take it very seriously. Um, <laughs> Did you wear your rash guard and? Uh, I wore a gi, a Mexican wrestling mask, a cape, and uh, one of those hammers that are behind me, the big ones. I feel like you're telling a lie. Hundred percent true. Hundred percent true. It's on TV, mate. What? 100% yeah. true. We'll, get, we'll get a picture and, of that. Uh, yeah, if you type in Daniel Strauss and Dan Strauss Ninja Warrior, and then, uh, and, and then when I say go, the timer starts, and I take the mask off, the gear off, and I've got a leopard leotard yeah. underneath. Show, you want yeah. a picture? Yeah. Show the camera. I have a leopard leotard underneath. <laughs> and then I actually made it back to the second stage, uh, but I'd already fallen, but I still managed to get it back on furthest fastest. And uh, so I came back for a second time. <laughs> there he is. Yeah, that's me. Yes, my left Very nice. <laughs> yeah, wait, I'll find a picture of me and the gi. Uh, and, uh, oh, you've got to, my, my uh, what do you call it? No. My uh, audition tape is the best yeah. part. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, the second time I was like, fuck, I need, I need to tell a story here. Um, I need to be an, I need to be a phoenix. So I dressed as a phoenix for the second one, <laughs> and then did even worse. Yeah, that's the audition tape. The audition tape's really good. Uh, so yeah, that's a good one. He didn't know about it. I'm ca yeah. that, that, I'm classing that. That'll do. That'll do. If you search Dan, if you search Dan Strauss Ninja Warrior audition tape, yeah, it's good. It, it was good. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the deep question we have, um, and it's one we've asked a previous guest. But oh, was this Jerry's ones? Yeah. Keep it in now. Oh. Is um, so is this basically, we've had previous podcasts and people ask questions, yeah. go to the next person, yeah, then ask you a question, take the next person. Okay. But I like this one quite a lot because it's relatively deep, but it's also interesting. Mm. Uh, so it's, which failure do you cherish the most? Oh. Mm. Which failure do I cherish the most? Very competitive. Don't, mm. Never like failing. Um, that's another hard one. I don't know. I don't know. I don't have a fucking clue. That's even harder than the last one you yeah. asked me. Yeah, oh. I don't know. I'll do I don't know. Piece. Yeah, you're doing well. Yeah. Great content. Yeah, great content. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely no answer. Like quite There's no answer thing. to anything yeah, yeah. at all. Yeah. It's like uh, an ASMR podcast. Yeah. Just that damn Saturday again. Hmm. Just being like, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's well, just good. stroking my beard. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool, that's fine. Uh, then we have is Give us some unpopular jiu-jitsu opinions that you've had. Well, I've already said that I had gear a couple of times, but I think that's quite popular. Yeah. Uh, unpopular jiu-jitsu opinions that I have. Fuck me. I feel like I need to pre... Um, you need to ask me these questions in advance so I can actually think of some good answers. 
some unpopular jiu-jitsu opinions. Okay, here's an interesting one. Uh, oh, no, it's not even... It's too specific, I feel. I feel like the head and arm choke is overrated. Uh, it's just something that I've been thinking about recently. And I just ask people to look out for it. I feel like it's in MMA, though, not in grappling. It doesn't really happen that much in grappling. When it happens, it's quite good. But I feel like people go for it all the time in MMA, and they very rarely get it. Um, even though it, it is quite a high percentage technique, but the amount that people get it versus the amount that they actually finish it is quite low. What other ones? Um, jiu-jitsu. Unpopular jiu-jitsu opinions. Oh, I don't know. Give me some... Give me some examples. Top, give, uh, yeah, give me so some examples. Yeah, why not? Ashley Bandor says single legs don't work. Okay. Yeah. Apparently, you just bounce back up. Yeah. Cause you just yeah, back up. yeah. 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 Uh, well, what we had. We had. Uh, you can't get good at no gi without training in the gi. Oh, that's fucking ridiculous. <laughs> Rich's gonna get all the hate. Um, it's fucking ridiculous. What was Shane's one? Oh, Shane's one. No. no that was Rich's. I don't think um, we actually had an unpopular jiu jitsu opinion. I didn't even manage to get on the end. No. Um, trying to think of the other ones now. Bloody hell. Sorry, everyone. Oh, um, yeah, Clayton and Ch um, Luke both said about how uh, lineage means basically fuck all. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Uh, Simon Hayes, in my first podcast I did with him, spoke about hidden lineage, which is, I think I really like that. Because, like, the people that you. You have a lineage, but it isn't necessarily the person who gave you a belt. Like, mm. like Roger, I'm a black belt under Roger. Roger never taught me jiu-jitsu ever. Yeah. I've literally never done a class with him. Like, <laughs> I think maybe I've done two or three seminars when he came to Mill Hill. But like, my jiu-jitsu was learned from Nick, and my jiu-jitsu was learned from watching Marcelo Garcia. My mm. jiu-jitsu was learned from other. Like, so in that regard, I think that lineage. Yeah, you know that that is correct. I think it's it's no more important, or it's. For some people, it's more relevant than it is to others. But just because you're a black belt under someone doesn't mean that doesn't mean anything really. Well, that was exactly their their, their argument was that you don't you haven't won their fights type thing. You haven't like gone in the sense that I know you've got your oh like just because I'm a Roger Gracie black belt doesn't mean shit because like Roger Gracie's the best. But you know I couldn't have I could have never competed. Like lots of his black belts have never competed. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's legit. What's the next question, then, man? Uh, next question we God, have. give me one I can answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, the one we have is, well, uh, you'll probably answer this one straight away. So, what's your opinions on hate towards Nogi? <laughs> From gay people. From gay I've people. Seen loads of people start jujitsu in the gi. And me and Jay and Joe on our last podcast, uh, which will come out tomorrow, um, have said, like, we think the gi is almost like an entry barrier for some people. Because you come into a gym, you see everyone wearing gi, you're like, shit, to join in, i got to grab the pyjamas. I've got to wear this. Yeah. Especially if you go to a specific school. I actually think that it might be the opposite. Do you reckon? Yeah, I think so. I think for women especially, this was something that I spoke about. Uh, I asked about it actually publicly on my Facebook many years ago because I was teaching at Mill Hill. I had a full-time no-gi program there and for the first year and a half I had zero female students we had like maybe 10 in the gi and zero in the no gi program really until Abby started training with me and then she was my only female student for about six months and then it started to pick up more steam and by the time I left there after teaching that after five years of running that program we had like 10 or 12 women in the no gi program um or maybe not that many but around about that um and I asked well, at the time when I had none I was like women, why do you not like no gi so much? And there were some really interesting answers. And I think that jiu-jitsu is intimidating and no gi is like physically, aesthetically more intimidating than gi is. Mm -hmm. Gi is like the, you couldn't wear anything that's less, um, that, 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 that is less unattractive than a gi it like <laughs> it just makes you a like a boxy mess it's yep. like completely unaesthetic in any way shape or form oh, so, so whether you're uh, whether you're like big and jacked super muscular you don't really see anything when you've got a gi on so mm. i think actually and, and i think there's something about a lot of people want to be 
part of a group so you put this on and now I'm with everyone else we're all kind of wearing the same yeah, thing exactly. whereas in the gi in no gi you see guys and they're fucking sweaty and they're pumped up mm. and they're jacked and the tight rash guards I think for a lot of people it can be quite intimidating uh, but I think it depends on who's coming in I think yeah. for older guys or guys who aren't sporty or women I think the gi can be appealing mm. I think for younger guys um, it's a little bit cooler yeah. to do no gi uh, but in terms of gi no gi hey look I just, I'm not saying that gi's bad I just don't like it and no one can say that no gi's bad but you're completely allowed to not like it as well I know plenty plenty of people who don't I mean it's so they must be so stupid but um, <laughs> there's plenty of people there yeah I don't know yeah uh, you gi guys are allowed to hate us we're allowed to hate you but we're, we're all doing we're all brothers at the end of the day we're all, we're all friends mm. what we really hate is karate <laughs> that's what we really hate we just need to be united on no Aikido sorry karate guys Aikido so the other questions we have for you is well, should we move to the guest question uh, we'll use that as the final one we'll yeah okay that. that's fine um, where is my phone because there are so many on Instagram it's ridiculous two uh, <laughs> yeah three <laughs> oh, let me scroll through five pages <laughs> <laughs> you can tell Dan that but yeah uh, just keeping it real Oh, that's the first one. Grappler Soap is not happy with you. Apparently he messaged you and you didn't reply to him. Oh, man, I get a lot of messages. Message me again. Dan, you heard it here first. Yeah, Message me again. Um, I'm sorry, brother. I don't, I don't ignore anyone on purpose. I just get a, lot of, I get a lot of messages. They go to, like, hidden folders. Some I don't genuinely don't get. You'll, you'll love this one because I know you get so many comments on this. One of my friends, James, has asked you specifically, where do you get your shirts from? Oh. Especially the one with the Greek soldiers on it. I so good, it isn't it? I copy. I need... No, when you're a shirt maker, tell me about it. Do you know what? Like, uh, to kill some of the magic, but also, like, make it a bit more accessible. That actually reminds me, I bought one for someone that I need to send off. Uh, most of the shirts I get are from TK Maxx. Amazing. That's where Done. most of the shirts I get Hell yeah. are from. Um, there used to be a shop that used to do quite a lot of good ones, but they don't do it anymore. Uh, occasionally, you'll find some good stuff online, but the majority of the time, they're from ASOS. Uh, not from ASA, sorry, uh, occasionally, but mo most of the time they're from TK Maxx. And because they're different, they're obviously they change the range often, mm. and they're different in every shop, so I'll do a tour. <laughs> Bro, that. Is that how I your went, seminars are based, based on what the TK Maxx yeah. stores are? <laughs> <laughs> basically, I mean, there's a TK Maxx in every single town, and I'll basically just, I'll just go through them. And I'll just like, I'll go there, it doesn't take long. But I'll, I'll go through like uh, those the Van Gogh ones that I yeah, yeah, had yeah. in the last one. Those are all TK Maxx. Yeah, some of the some of the ones you've worn for life. And a lot of the time, a lot of the time, uh, a lot of the time you'll go through and you're like, this is just shit. Uh, there's nothing here. <laughs> but sometimes you go through and they'll be gold. Yeah. So TK Maxx is a great um, shirt yeah. uh, resource. You, you wait, TK Maxx and start selling like, secondhand geese and movie <laughs> stuff on <laughs> somewhere. All these they should people. be selling some lumberjack stuff. Is what they yeah. should be selling. Uh, not a question, but just some appreciation. Yeah. Uh, in specific words, I won't name the person. Holy fuck, I love that man. <laughs> anything that is training, nutrition, next comp is gold. Ah, oh, so yeah, next uh, competition. You got anything in mind? So I'm back. Uh, having finished the tour, um, I'm I've been back for a couple of weeks now, so I'm getting back in the training. My body has immediately rejected the training, and I'm completely fucking broken. Uh, <laughs> my, the, it, this frustrating thing about have a drink. When you, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I've got much better. <laughs> um, there's this horribly frustrating thing where when you aren't able to train, your 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 desire to train becomes very very high, and then when you are sort of it's like a dog being held back and then let loose, but then when you're deconditioned from training and you hit it at hundred percent your body just go and uh, so so I mean t so at the moment my shoulders are like kind of really bad uh, but I wasn't even that wasn't in training that was, I was away I was mm. in uh, Cambodia and I just woke up one day and my shoulder was gone so maybe that's just being in your 30s uh, but um, so so my plan was to kind of get back in the training for a month or so and then start eyeing up some competition so hopefully over the next couple of months I'm gonna do some small like competition co like tournaments just to get some time back in, back in training, because I've only competed once since I tore my pec in summer 21. Uh, that was Euro Nogi uh, last year. Um, so I'm planning to do that. I'm possibly going to be doing ADCC trials in September, but I want to get some mat time in. So, you know, just, just some little tournaments where I can just go and have some fun. Nice. So that's cool. the plan, if my fucking body will let me do it. So I do want to touch on this, because it's not really a question. It's more something I'm interested in. Yeah, hit me, brother. 
quintet. Yes. You got flown out to Japan. Oh, it's the greatest thing ever. Yeah. For you, and obviously you competed against some fucking big ass names. Yeah. What was better, competing against AJ Agazan? Bro. Or Sakuraba. Sakuraba. It, what was better in terms of like, if I could only have done one of them? Sakuraba was, competing against Sakuraba was the greatest moment of my life. Yeah. Like, undoubtedly, that was the greatest moment. Like, that was, Sakuraba was my absolute hero um, when I got into grappling many years ago. Um, like, I had all, Sakuraba was the reason why I went back to Scramble. So I was with Scramble when, I was Scramble's second sponsored athlete, like, many years ago when they started. Then I left uh, and went with Bad Boy, and then I dropped Bad Boy, and I was free agent sponsor wise. And the only reason why I went back on the me- no, no only reason that's gonna be upset. One of the <laughs> Sorry, one of the man. one of the big reasons why I went back is because they were working with Sakuraba, and he legitimately was like my fucking hero. So I went back, and then um, so but 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 I never had any idea. It was not a dream of mine to compete against Sakuraba because it would have been a preposterous dream. Yeah. You know, he was a gen- f- two generations a- a- ahead of me. He was an MMA fighter, not a grappler. I was just a pure grappler. Um, and then, and then Matt from Scramble and Polaris messaged me and said, "Sakuraba's running a show." I said, "I'm in." And originally it was in LA. Uh, Sakuraba's running a show. I go, "I'm in." And he goes, "It's in LA." Yep. Team grappling event. Will you represent? Polaris, 100% I'm in. And he goes, okay, it's in Japan now. I'm like, holy shit, Japan's like the country I've wanted to compete. I've wanted to go to, but I've had a dream of competing in. Back when I wanted to do MMA, Japan was, you know, when I first got into to, to jiu-jitsu and MMA, uh, Japan was the holy grail of, 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 you know, with pride and stuff like that. So I was like, fuck, I'm going to be able to compete in Japan. Never thought I'd be able to do that. That's incredible. And then later on he goes, and Sakuraba's competing in the tournament. And now when that happened, and I met Sakuraba the day before the tournament and posted up this picture, you know, met my hero, and there's a chance that we could even compete tomorrow. But the chance was very, very small because so so many specific things would have happened for that to have aligned up. I mean, it could have gone a thousand different ways. So when it actually ended up, like everything was perfect, not only the fact that I competed against him, but I'd already submitted two of his team members, meaning that I could take him to a draw, take us both out, and I've taken three out of five people out from one team. That, like, I didn't have to submit him, is mm. what I'm basically saying. So all of that combined meant that I could just go out there and have eight minutes grappling with, like, a legitimate fucking legend in yeah. Sakuraba. Um, it was the coolest thing ever. It was the coolest thing ever. Matt took an awesome picture of me and him. Probably my favorite picture in existence. I had it printed and here um, like in my bedroom, not literally uh, here. Yeah. In, <laughs> printed big in my bedroom <laughs> before I even got back from Japan. Really? Still there, yeah, and from from in front of my bed. Uh, I still look at it every day. Yeah. How long were you, out of interest in that moment, obviously when you're rolling with him, was there like a like I don't know, like? <laughs> oh, it was weird, man. It was weird. Yeah, like, there were a few moments. There was one. Uh, there was one regret, which was uh, so Sakuraba. He was he he was he grapples weird, obviously. But he used near side underhook from side control. Mm-hmm. So my the way that I kill near side underhook from side control is to take forearm underneath the neck, and if they keep fighting it, you switch. So it, it means that they can't come out the back door. Mm. I switch it with my shin. So my regret is that I put my sh- knee on his neck for like a good minute. <laughs> <laughs> and in hindsight I'm like this was highly disrespectful and I should not have done that uh, but there was one moment where I was on my back and obviously Sakuraba's like signature move was the run and the jump and the stomp and uh, and I'm on my back in playing guard and he runs jumps over me but as he jumps over me I had almost like time froze for a second and like I'm on my back I'm in a giant sumo arena on this map big lights ahead of me Sakuraba's like in the air with both feet there and it was just like this is completely surreal and then boom <laughs> everything comes back in he lands behind me and we carry on grappling and yeah it was super cool that, yes. that yes. sounds really cool it was the best um, yeah I guess let's wrap up with the, the final question then shall we Sweet. final question yeah Yeah. very written down so it was a bit lengthy yeah, dude. yeah it is a bit lengthy okay but it's hopefully good. I can goddamn answer yeah, this one yeah. yeah no I think you should be fine with this one I think so 
yeah. Wow. Dan's, Dan's already beaten someone called Thor. Like, <laughs> I know you said before. Before. I, uh, well, yeah. We'll talk, uh, I don't, uh, we'll talk about that afterwards. Yeah, go I, on. I watched a lot. I was, I was there in Polaris squads and I was not fucking happy with some of the decisions that were given, but hey, it's, it is it's what it is, right? Um, so, the question we have for you from a guest is if you could give one piece of advice mm. or tips on how to improve mindset or pressure towards competition, what would it be? Mm. Yeah, that's a really a real classic one. So many people struggle with this. Um, I don't know if I have anything like revolutionary to say about it, um, but what I would say is, you know what? I gave this piece of advice. Someone messaged me on Instagram asking for advice, and I gave this piece of advice. And he later, it was not actually in in the context of of doing like a competition. He was performing. He was a drummer, and he was performing. It's like kids. He was doing a performance with his kid at, for the school or something like that. And he was super nervous about it. And I think that visualization is such a powerful tool in a scenario like this, where of course, if, you're, if, if you compete 100 times, you're going to be a lot less nervous than if you've competed once, twice, or never. Uh, if you have never competed, then how are you going to get to 100 without going through one, two, three, four, and the rest? And the way that you can do it, it's not quite the same, but it's a lot more than doing nothing, which is to visualize it. Um, visualize yourself warming up. Visualize yourself being called to the mat. Visualize yourself walking out there, slapping hands, getting into competition. Because what I find is that um, once you slap hands and go, everything's chill. It's the leading up to that. Mm -hmm. it's the, it's the, yeah. For some people, it's a week beforehand, days beforehand, night beforehand, morning of, hour before. Generally, that's when it really hits most people, the hour before, a couple of hours before, you know, the butterflies in your stomach, the nerves. First thing is to understand is whatever you're feeling, they're feeling as well. This isn't a unique thing that you're feeling that no one else does. It's very, very common. And I think sometimes just understanding that what you're going through is you look around and everyone's hiding it well. What you don't realize is that you're hiding it well as well. You know, it's like something that I'd always, people would always say when they, they grapple, they go, they felt so strong. They're surprised at how strong the person that they grapple with felt. And uh, the funny thing is, it, I think it's just because of the adrenaline, more of your nervous system is firing and you just kind of output a lot more. It's why your forearms yeah. blow up in competition. They don't blow up in training. Right. They blow up in competition because you're squeezing so much harder. So when you think that they feel way stronger than you expect, they're thinking that you feel way stronger. You know? yeah. So it's like everything's balanced. Like you're not going through anything differently to what the person that you're going up against or what everyone else goes through when they compete. So sometimes just understanding that can be helpful. But visualization as a technique is really powerful. Like just spending time, you can do it. You've got a competition in four weeks, you can do it every day. You can step on, you can visualize yourself warming up, stepping on the mat, competing, winning, whatever, 10 times every single day by the time you step into a competition you've been here a thousand times before and it's going to be a lot easier to do um so there's there's i think some people there's like a reframing of what you're doing other stuff another reframing that's a really big one is just uh, truly understanding that how you do in competition n like are you a professional black belt who makes their living competing the answer is no nobody gives a shit how you're going to do in this competition like people white belts blue belts <laughs> a white belt masters too who's competing for the first time you're, you, nobody cares how you're going to do they're just like kind of happy that you're competing to be honest if you win that's great if you lose it's like you're not going to be kicked out of the gym so many people put pressure on themselves because they feel like everyone around them like their family their friends their teammates their coach is putting this pressure on them there's no pressure on you so one's like a reframing and the other one's like a practical thing that you can do to help with your like mindset and your psychology which is the visualization stuff which can be really useful can i extend that a little bit the mm. question what happens if you are one of the lead coaches of that club but you're not let's say black belt you're higher higher belt which we say obviously purple brown and yeah you have the pressure of there, there is more pressure that's a little bit more real I mean, I feel pressure when I think about competing, especially when like I haven't competed for a while or I'm coming back from injury or I'm like not in the best shape. Like I feel that there's an expectation for me to win. And uh, sometimes, and for a lot of people that can stop them from competing at all. But for those people, you can do the uh, visualization stuff, but the yeah. framing stuff, if like the reality is there is pressure on you and it's undeniable, the pressure is probably not as much as you think it is. You're probably not going to lose your life if you if the competition doesn't go you well. You aren't teaching here anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I think a lot. 
yeah, I did, like I my coach has lost, my coach has won, and it's great when they win, but when they lose, you're like everyone understands that. People understand. Mm. Sometimes you've got to lose to actually even be able, to be able to relate with your students. You can't just win everything all the time. You know, seeing someone as an instructor losing, coming back and winning again in the future is almost more impressive than just winning every tournament that you ever go to. Yeah. You know, it's something that helps you relate to your students a little bit more. Uh, so yeah, there, there, there may be more pressure if there's higher stakes, you're a black belt, you're an instructor, people are going to be looking up to you, people have this idea in their head that, you know, everyone thinks that their instructor is invincible and then they go to the tournament, they get tapped out in five minutes, but like, that's just life, that's the game that we play. Um, and I think at the end of the day, you probably regret not competing more than competing and losing. That I like, you'll probably regret more competing, not competing type of thing. That's probably. pretty cool. That's a wicked way to sign off. I don't, I don't know many people who have competed lost and regretted going to the competition true mm. um shout out to any sponsors mate anything like that at all um i guess scramble do technically sponsor me cerberus strength scramble uh not really i can do my main stuff check me out on instagram at raspberry underscore ape my website is raspberry.com but you can also check out my new online academy which is apeacademyonline.com for my sandbag training grip training or guillotine essentials instructional uh that's about it wicked well look thank you very much dude cheers mate thank you thank you very much no worries